Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I've got a head cold. Bear with me. I sound a little nasally. Let's get through the ads and into the episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens. Think nutritional insurance. Think of the easiest way to fill in those gaps where you might be nutritionally deficient. It is by far the easiest and most delicious nutritional habit that you can add to your health routine today. One scoop of Athletic Greens contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multi-mineral, probiotic green superfood blend, and more that all work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet. Increasing energy and focus aid with digestion and supports a healthy immune system all without the need to take multiple products. I mean, who has the time to do that? Right now, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system. The winter months are coming, and that's never a bad time to add some vitamin D. Right now, they're offering the audience a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with the first purchase if you visit the link in the show notes today. You'll basically never have to buy vitamin D again. So whether you're looking for a peak performance or just better health, covering your bases with Athletic Greens makes investing in your energy, immunity, and gut health each day simple, tasty, and efficient. Simply visit athleticgreens.com slash cleared hot and join health experts, athletes, and health conscious go-getters around the world who make a daily commitment to their health every day. Athleticgreens.com slash cleared hot and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Mountain Tough. If you're looking for a community of like minded individuals who are training as if their life may depend on it, then you don't need to look any farther. If you're looking to increase mental toughness or build muscle or improve your endurance anytime, anywhere from any mobile device, from inside of a gym or even just at home with no equipment whatsoever, Mountain Tough is going to be your one-stop resource. In my own experience, nothing worthy or difficult is ever accomplished alone. And the community of nearly 10,000 like-minded athletes from the Mountain Tough community are going to help hold you accountable. Personally, I can't even begin to express the value of others propping me up on those days where I just don't want to head into the gym. Mountain Tough has committed thousands of hours of testing on dedicated mountain hunters, first responders, and military personnel. Like I said, people who are training as if their life may depend on it. The programs that they offer, let me just tell you, there's something on there for everybody. I actually challenge you to go to mountaintough.com slash cleared hot and actually look through what they have to offer, whether it's the no gear programs or the gym or home gym programs, and find something that doesn't work for you. They have something for the aficionado and the high-end athlete and everything in between. And if you're a hunter, by all means, check out the gym or home gym programs and you're going to look right there. It's all designed around that hunting season. Their programs come with guidance for the beginner, the intermediate, and even elite athletes. And you'll have lifetime access to any programs that you purchase. What I cannot stress enough is the community that they have created and the value that can come from that community support. The right nudge from the right person at the right time can change your destiny. And regardless of your age or circumstances, I am nudging you to start today as I know the Mountain Tough programs and the Mountain Tough community will enable you to become the best version of yourself. Mountain Tough is offering the listeners 20% off. So go to mountaintough.com slash cleared hot to receive that 20% off. That is M-T-N, Mike Tango November, tough regular spelling dot com slash cleared hot. This episode is also brought to you by Feels. Now, when it comes to CBD, it's not about what you feel. It's supposed to be about what you don't feel, stress, anxiety, and pain. Feels is a better way to feel better. Go to feels.com slash cleared hot, and you're going to get 50% off of your first order with free shipping. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is CBD? What do I use it for? Well, Feels is a premium CBD that will help keep your head clear and help you keep feeling your best. It's hassle-free, delivered directly to your door. CBD naturally helps reduce stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. The beauty is there's no hangover or addiction. You place a few drops of Feels under your tongue, and you're going to feel the difference within minutes. The thing to remember about CBD is that finding the right dose is important, and everybody's dose is different. I highly recommend their Flight, which is three different dosages, which will allow you to experiment. If you're new to CBD, well, don't worry about it. Feels offers a free CBD hotline to help guide you through your personal experience that you find the perfect dose. The customer service team is dedicated to making sure you get the best use of your CBD. And joining the Feels monthly membership makes your self-care very easy. You'll save money on every order, and you can just pause or cancel anytime. Start feeling better with Feels. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash cleared hot, and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That is F-E-A-L-S dot com slash cleared hot to become a member and get 50% off automatically 
taken off your first order with free shipping. Feels.com slash cleared up. Last but never least, the sponsor that I think I get the most feedback about. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. If there is something interfering with your happiness or it's preventing you from achieving your goals, personally, professionally, whatever it may be, BetterHelp is here to assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. Now, remember, this is not a crisis line and it's not self-help. This is a connection to a professional counseling or counselor done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available depending on where you live because the service is available for clients worldwide due to the fact that it's hosted on the internet. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You're going to get a timely and thoughtful response. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't have to sit in waiting rooms if they make you uncomfortable. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. And I can't stress this enough. Do not give up on the process if you don't click with the first person that they connect you with. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com slash cleared hot. That is better com slash cleared hot and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional counselor. In fact, so many people have been taking advantage of their service. They're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash cleared hot. And that's it. We're through the business side of the house. My guest today is one of my favorite people. Her name is Evie Pompuras, and she is a goddamn force to be reckoned with. She is a former special agent with the U.S. Secret Service. Before that, you know, she came from the LEO background. She's been on TV, both in the, well, I met her when we were working on a TV show. So I'm going to say from the entertainment side, as well as the educational side, when it comes to reporting on the news. She is a professor, and she's also the author of a wildly successful book that I cannot recommend enough, especially to female listeners and your daughters, Becoming Bulletproof. Protect yourself, read people, influence situations, and live fearlessly. Episode number 189 with Evie Pompouris. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on, wait a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. This is amazing. It's been an interesting journey. The podcast, the first gear that I had, I had a, a sponsor that I stopped working with a few years ago, but they were great. 511 Tactical. Yes. So right around the time that Joe recommended to me that I start doing a podcast, I was working with them. And one of the things that they did for me as a, as a sponsor was they actually bought me the first gear that I used. And it's been an interesting iteration. Uh, it started with one of the Zooms, which is pro- honestly, it's about this big, a little bit thicker. And then some stand-up microphones that used to like to fall over on me. So I'd have actual <laughs> like two and a half pound weightlifting little disc weights that I would hold them in place. No video cameras whatsoever. And then I think I added a GoPro. Then I added some Sony handy cams. Then I upgraded to that board that I had when we were up in Whitefish the yes. last time. And then the pandemic hit. And I figured, fuck it. Let's just go all in on with what I can do. A guy I do jujitsu with, like the Renaissance man of Montana, made this table out of what I'm going to say Montana wood. I could be completely making that up though. In my mind, this wood's all from Montana. It's all local. And I found the office suite. And by that, I mean I had somebody else find it for me, and I signed the lease. And then got some other cameras and happened to know a guy who works for Joe, like as his producer. And I was like, hey, man, what gear do you use? Yeah. And he sent me a list. And here we are. Well, I want to tell you that I am, not that you need me to tell you this, but I am really proud of you. Like, really proud. This is an easy thing. Do you want me to, I can, when I'm finished with this though, I yes. can list out all the things that I fuck up all the time and you'll be far <laughs> less proud of me. Because that list is much longer than the things I do correctly. Well, you know, it probably <laughs> matches my list, but I'm serious. I remember how you started off because I had done a podcast with you yep. and we had worked together before that. So, and I also know it's hard when you leave, at least for me, leaving a career in service to go into 
business or working for your own, I, I struggled because I really had to change my mindset. I didn't have a business mindset. I was used to doing things for somebody else or service, you know, you're serving something else. And then I, I can't speak for you, but I struggled with now I'm speaking for myself. And I really had to learn how to function, how to speak, how to run a business. I still don't know if I'm very good at running a business. I'm getting better at making decisions for myself. Uh, it, I would say that's one of the main things that military people in general, I think, struggle with is they go from an environment where it's very task centric, where you can just knock down tasks that are in front of you, but they're presented by other people. And then you get out and you have to find your own tasks. So they're really, they can be project oriented, but I think they turn their wheels a little bit trying to figure out what their next project should be. It's because of the hierarchy, because you're there's a chain of command, yeah. and you're also, you're looking to someone else to tell you it's okay. And I remember doing that when I started working in TV. I had an agent and a manager, and I would ask them, is this okay to do? Can I do this? And I remember thinking, I'm like, they work for me. I pay them. And it's, I think it's just that chain of command mindset. You don't make your own decisions, really. Although decisiveness, it's interesting because I teach criminal justice and criminology, and one of the the positives of being in uh, the line of work that you and I used to be in is decisiveness because when you're out either on the street or in theater, you have to make a decision on your own in that moment. So decisiveness is actually something that you create and then the science actually shows, I'm gonna go a little nerdy on you. The science actually shows decisiveness is a huge attribution to being confident, building confidence because you make your own decisions. Sounds reasonable. Yeah. It's absolutely true. But also cynicism is one of the main um, characteristics of people from our line of work as well. That and I would say sarcasm. It's my primary weapon system. It has been my entire life. I fall back on it as a defense mechanism. Yours is. But I'm not funny. I have no humor. Zero. You have more than you think. It uh, might be accidental, but it's there for sure. <laughs> You're definitely. Because there's sometimes you throw things out, especially when we worked on that TV show, Hunted, and I would have to How call you. How dare you? How dare How, you I'm bring bringing up it up. shit it's, show of a we, CBS we, show? We, we all come from somewhere. I did not come from there. That's how you and I first crossed paths That's true. virtually. Because we didn't actually we meet each other met. until I took you skydiving that one day. Yes. Which is not generally how I meet people for the first time, but hey, it worked itself out. We were like buddies by then, though. We were. We were. Uh, it's camaraderie, shared suffering and laughter, which is the exact <laughs> and precise definition of that TV show that we did, which shall remain unnamed. I just, I just said it. I know. I know. <laughs> just trying to move it along. Just trying to move it along away from that topic. I hear you. I hear you. How, uh, how is teaching criminal justice in the modern environment? Well, so... It's, I don't know, it's interesting because crime is definitely going up in New York because I'm in, still in New York City, although now I'm thinking differently. And um, crime is definitely going up. You're seeing a lot more happening in the streets, a lot more subway crime. And I teach for the City University of New York, and it's always interesting to me when my students come in how they feel. What I do actually the first day of class is I give them an essay assignment. I ask them, tell me who you are, um, why are you enrolled in this school, why are you taking criminal justice, how do you feel about the criminal justice system, you know, be honest, mm -hmm. and what interaction have you ever had with the criminal justice system. I will tell you, predominantly the majority of my students actually feel very positive toward it. So I always get, you know, when, but the narrative very much so is very different now. There's that's why this I asked dislike. you that. That's how why I asked you that question. It seems like the past few years have been very rough on that occupation. Whether, as with most things, anomalous instances seem to gather or gain traction exponentially, and they don't represent the overall uh, totality of law enforcement in, uh, interactions. To speak specifically, so a very negative uh, interaction can paint an entire community of individuals. And I find that even up here, I, I think less up here, but even up here, people are now viewing law enforcement from a different perspective at the very least. Or there's a level of when an interaction begins, it starts from distrust and then trust has to be built. As opposed to, I remember growing up, I don't think I have, I don't, you know, you hear people like, oh, you need to be, you know, don't have an interaction with the cops, you know, and like, and like your parents would try to scare you into in, or about interactions. But I remember 
speaking with them when I was younger, and I never had any inclination of fear or distrust. If anything, it was the other way. It was started with trust, and I guess that individual interaction could change that, but it seems like that's the opposite of uh, the modern day, based again on, I mean, uh, people don't like to talk often about just pure mathematics, but they're pretty black and white, no pun intended whatsoever. They have they are colorless, but they paint a much more accurate picture of the environment in general. And those events are very, very anomalous. They're not the norm. So here's the thing. There are 17,000 law enforcement entities in the United States. You're talking about like departments? Departments. That's departments, agencies, um, organizations throughout the United States. So each one functions autonomously, meaning each one's got its own police commissioner or um, person in charge, police chief. Now, the problem is each one functions on its own. It's got its own rules. It's got its own training program. It's got its own resources. And here's the kicker. Half of the police departments in the United States have 10 officers or less. So if you look at this and what happens is everyone says police and they put everybody in this circle this group, and each department functions differently. Also, each one has different resources. Each one has different criteria of how to get in. Some departments may let you get hired right out of high school. Other departments, like the NYPD where I started, I had to have at minimum, the person had to have at minimum two years college classes. So it's all different, the hiring process. And so within that, you're going to, it's it's any job, you're going to get people that should not be there. Or maybe they come in there and then you have this, you get the badge, you get the gun, you get the sometimes that bravado and you're not making the right choices. But overall, and I hope my, my, my data is correct, again, because I teach this, and if it's approximately 1.4% of all law enforcement e- either use threat uh, um, um, or the, you know, f- the force of threat, excuse me, Deadly e- force, you're talking? Yes. Either it's a le- it's 1.4% of law enforcement that will either use force or the threat of force towards someone. So the, the numbers are actually quite low. I spent 13 years overall in law enforcement for NYPD, then U.S. Secret Service. I never discharged my weapon. The majority of law enforcement don't discharge their weapons. I remember when I started in the NYPD, the first thing like I heard in my, we had a police science class and the the sergeant that came up, he said, you know, if you go your entire career and you never discharge your weapon, by my account, you've had a great career. Mm. And the majority do not do that. The majority go in because they want to make a difference. They they want to help. And full disclosure, I hated police. They'd pull me over. I had my tinted windows. I was from Queens. I had the loud music. You're talking about before you became a cop? Before. All right. And <laughs> I was going to say, what? Before, like when man, I was younger. The Manchurian candidate of police officers <laughs> no, here. No, no, no. Before. I was a brat. They'd pull me over. And I'm like, what? what? I remember one time they pulled me over on a Saturday night. My uh, headlight was out. It was, and I remember he pulls me over and I was such a brat. I was like, don't you have anything better to do than to be out on Saturday night, give tickets? I feel like that's a guaranteed ticket. Yeah, I feel like- I got it. Did, yeah, I got it. That's what I'm saying. I think there's other ways you could deal with that and not get the ticket. I didn't say I was intelligent at the time. No. I just, that's who I was. But then eventually I went into law enforcement. But when I joined, it was pre 9-11. So it's interesting because at that time, there was a huge dislike, a huge distrust for law enforcement. So- it kind of feels where we are now. It, it's analogous. I remember in the academy, the NYPD, we would run um, by the West Side Highway. West Side Highway has this service road like by the water, and they'd take us and we'd run in ranks. And we had, I'm sorry, it, I'm the girl. The, we had these ugly cargo shorts that they made us wear, like they were like made out of canvas and gray t-shirts. And But you could tell we were police recruits. And we would run in ranks. And Andy, people are driving by doing 50, 60, they're flipping you the bird, they're spitting on you, they're calling you names. And I remember that was my first exposure to that. And I remember being confused because I was quite young when I got in or when I started thinking, I'm trying, I want to help. I want to make a difference. I don't understand this. Like, I didn't understand that level of hate. Hmm. Do you think it's an NYC specific thing? Because, I mean, obviously I grew up in a much smaller town in Santa Cruz the chief of police at the time when I was growing up played football with my dad. So perhaps I got a different experience from the interactions that I had, but I don't remember ever a point in my life thinking it'd be a good idea to like flip off police recruits or 
recruits or spit on them. It's always been just yes, sir, no, ma'am. So I, New York's different. New York's different. I think, well, I've spent very little time in New York, and it's different in many ways for me. I think, mo- I think what we see in metropolitan areas in big cities like Los Angeles, New York, maybe Miami, like those bigger cities, you will see a more disrespect or more yeah. talking back or more you know, go ahead and arrest me, you know, even when you're trying to get people comply. You definitely, there's a different psyche. And especially now, you, you very much see it. There is a different psyche where you are more likely to talk back, to fight back, to do things. I mean, I when I started in the Secret Service too, I was in the New York field office. So it, it wasn't, people didn't always comply. I mean, I think that's where sometimes it gets lost. People think just talk to them. And it's, you, it's hard to talk to people when they they, you know, they don't want to get arrested. They don't want to speak to you. Yeah, they, you throw drugs and alcohol into that mix too. It's not going to get any better. When they, when somebody's intoxicated, it really affects them. You don't know who this person is. What's going on? I remember once we um, arrested someone, and he had, and we put him down on the ground, and immediately cuffed him, and he had razor blades tied, excuse me, taped on the inside of his belt. And so what? And they had told us, watch. There was a kind of a trend happening where they would. If they came across you, they would pull out a razor razor blade and slice you. So these things would happen a lot. They'd run from you. They'd fight you. And, I mean, I had some, I was very lucky. And I did have one moment where I almost discharged my weapon. And I remember, like, literally inside myself, as I'm looking at this person, I'm thinking, please comply. Please comply. I just don't want, I don't want to shoot anybody. Yeah. I, I don't want to. And I think that that's where maybe sometimes it gets lost, where Maybe some of the public thinks that that that's what people want to do. Law enforcement. I you well, don't want to. Well, when they're shown to. on the media, and I'll use that term as broadly as people want to go, whether it's on their phone, a traditional media source, or Instagram and Facebook, when most of what they're seeing is uh, a use of force or a deadly use of force, it's I can understand why they think that that's the vast majority of police interactions. It's not true. It's just the vast majority of what they're seeing. But that's what's interesting that's what the tv is going to show the news is going to show i i started doing news i i began yeah. my career after the service working in the news talking about crime and analyzing things and there we would only show the the negative stuff we would only show the bad stuff because those are the cases those are the stories that keep you from changing the channel to change commercial the vast majority don't there is let, there is not that violence. There is not that discharge of weapon. However, when you see those instances, and there are certain instances, even myself, where I see people, I'm like, how did you get a badge and gun? Yeah. You have those moments where you look at that and think, you you ruin it for everybody else. You have no business caring. And it would be false for me to say that I didn't experience that in my career where I would see certain people and I would think, you should not be carrying a badge and gun. Or you'd see someone and you'd like, this guy, you know, got way, bullied way too much when he was young. Now he's got a badge and gun and he's kind of, that's not, that is not your job. Your job, at the end of the day, you are there to serve the public, the public's overall safety. But at the same time, you have to have the ability and the trust of the public and the backing so that you can do your job. So that when now a call comes in, you're not driving slower because you're thinking, I don't, Wanna? What's going? What am I going to walk into? What's going to happen? Am I going to get in trouble if I pull out my weapon? Um, if I put hands on someone? When you can talk to people, look. The best thing is to get people to comply. If you can verbally work with people, that's great. But the minute you put your hands on someone, it goes south. It goes south. Generally, yeah. But also, I think it's important to remember the people you're talking about. Where from inside that law enforcement community, you say, hey. You, there's no way you should have a badge and gun. That exists in every community. I've yes. worked with people that were like that. Uh, there's a reason why malpractice insurance is required for doctors because there's people who got straight A's in medical school and then there's dudes who got D minuses and F's. Those are called Navy doctors, by the way, that D minus and F tranche. Uh, then they go to military medicine and then go into traditional afterwards. But uh, let's see here. How's religion stacking up against having some bad apples? Not great. I, I can't right. think of a single community of people that doesn't have individuals that fall short. But if all you see is that individual falling short, like the stories you're talking about, the ones that keep you glued to the channel so they can sell you soap in the next ad break, 
Those are also the stories that make people uncomfortable when they get pulled over and a police officer is walking up and they have distrust in the back of their head as opposed to, hey, I'm going to act like a responsible professional human being and I might get a ticket, but we're all going to get out of this okay. It escalates people's anxiety. That's the thing. Yeah. So when you see this stuff, you see this media stuff. That's the smarter way to say what I just said. That's just some dumb dumb. But <laughs> <laughs> don't ever it say that. It escalates about people's you. anxiety. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to say. It like escalates 50 people's more words. anxiety, but it also ex- escalates law enforcement's anxiety as well because they're how is this person going to react? Yeah. What am I going to have to deal with? You you worry about those things. It's I think it, it, it ebb and flows. Look, historically, now I'm going to get really nerdy. If you look at law enforcement when it was created historically over the years, it's always had high corruption. It's always had high distrust. In fact, when they when the first police department started, I think it was in, in London, Metropolitan Police Department, first public police department, policing actually used to be private. Only people who had money could pay for security. And then what happened was society looked at, at, at that and said, that's not fair. Only the wealthy have the ability to have security. So if you stole from me, I would have to pay a private company to come to you to get, to get what was owed back to me, and I would have to pay them. So eventually London was, you know, said we have to create a public police force, and that's how you had real policing, a true public police force. And it, ebbed, you know, it started from there. But initially when they hired people, there was no standards. They just give them, you know, a badge, a club. Um, put them out on the street. And so historically, it's always had a bad reputation. Over the years, they began to look at it differently. Even criminal justice, the term criminal justice, the system, that didn't really start to like the 60s and 70s. Man, I feel like I'm teaching class right now, <laughs> my students. And so there was no system. It was very disjointed. It was it was corrupt. You, you had people, there was a high alcohol alcoholism. They weren't training them properly. So there's a commission was done and they stepped in to say, okay, we need to fix this. And then as they looked at the issues and figured out that we have to have a training process, and then they took that training process, which was paramilitary. So the way law enforcement is trained today is paramilitary. It's basically mimic from, you know, the military. That's why when I first went in and they were teaching me parade rest and standing at attention, I remember being confused. I was like, oh, no, no, I didn't I didn't join the military. I came to the academy. So those are just all disciplinary tools with it. Having been an instructor, you do those things that seem senseless because it gives you an opportunity to remediate and correct the students uh, when there maybe is nothing else to remediate or correct them for. You can always adjust somebody's foot position. You know, you can if you're looking for an error that uh, requires attention, you can find them when it starts coming to those, we'll call those parade ground maneuvers. <laughs> well, I'll be honest, I didn't know anything about that stuff. I, I, I didn't know what front leaning rest was. I didn't know any of it. But also it, known as a push up for people <laughs> listening. Yeah. Oh, okay. In case yeah. anybody doesn't know, I spent quite a bit of time down there. Yeah. Um, but for me, it was the best experience of my life. I would not be who I am today, driven and and. I, I just would not. I, I'm so thankful I went into that field. And whenever I have students who, who, and I always let my students speak openly. I said, this is your space. You speak openly. Don't ever let the fact that my background in law enforcement feel you biased or feel that you need to say anything. I want you, I will present you facts and then you all make your own decisions about how you feel. I don't ever want to influence anyone, especially my students. I just feel like we live in a world today where everyone is telling you what you should think. And it's just one of the things I really dislike. And I tell my students, I am not here to tell you what what to think. I'm here to teach you. And then you make your own decisions. But I always tell them, if you don't like the system, go in and fix it. You fix it from the inside. Go in and change it. You don't change it with hate. Are the students, do they have some pretty spirited and heated debates inside of your classroom? Not in my class. I run it. I, I think because of the way I come in, I come in as a... I'm a professor, but I also come in as an authority figure, mm-hmm. and I lay the groundwork from day one. This is my class. You can... I don't mean with you. I mean with each other. No, I don't allow it. I will never allow it. You won't allow... Uh... I don't allow disrespect in my class. No, no, not dis- I'm not t- talking disrespect. Do they feel comfortable taking you up on your offer of an environment where you can actually discuss an issue? And It's one of the things that I wish existed more is the ability to discuss with somebody a topic that you don't agree on professionally and leave the conversation better off for it, but also still disagreeing. They uh, do. They do. And they that's do. what I mean, because you're trying yes. to lay that foundation. So I'm, I'm curious 
Uh, a lot of people will try to lay that foundation online where it just fails because people can say whatever they want to without consequence online. I'm just curious in face-to-face -face environments if they're actually taking you up on that offer. So in my classroom, they are they do share their thoughts and they will have opposing thoughts. And I don't know if it's because of the way I structure the classroom or the vibe of the students. They articulate to each other and I tell them, you can say, I hear what you're saying. Mm. I see it this way and this is why. So I caveat that so that they can have a disagreement in in a respectful way. So they do that and I, I now that I think about it, it's probably because I tell them from the beginning of class that first day, you all will respect each other's opinions. You all you can you can speak towards another student and say, This is why I see it differently or this is how I feel, but you are never to dismiss somebody else's perception. And they do that. I have never had an issue. And I've been teaching now six years. Oh, my goodness. Six years I've been teaching. Right after I left the service, I think I started. And I've never had an issue. But they, but I also lay the, the groundwork to teach them, learn how to talk to each other. Yeah. And I think that's a big thing. That's it's a, missing for sure. It is because we're in a space right now where everyone's telling you what to think, what to do. And everyone's trying. No one's really listening to one another. And I think part of it is it's people's belief system. What happens is... I believe something, you believe something, but then I think you're wrong for believing that. And now, rather than listening to you, all I'm trying to do is to convince you why I'm right and why you should change. And then you have that same perspective. My belief system is wrong. You're going to try to convince me to change my perspective. And so you're not listening to me. I'm not listening to you. No one's accepting of each other. The problem here, and this is why everything is so polarized, you cannot change somebody's belief system. A belief system is something that someone has created or accumulated over time. It's something that's embedded in them, whether through experience, whether through the way they were raised, their environment, and you cannot change it. So for example, when I did interrogations in the service, I would do interviews um, of individuals who are either terrorists or terrorist sympathizers, and they would either be here or would be overseas. And when I would do those interviews, I would go in understanding I need specific information. I need to know when this next attack is going to happen, right, let's say. And that's when I, the mindset I went in with. I did not go in with the mindset, hey, we're America. We're really the good guys, and you guys are really the bad guys. Slap the old constitution <laughs> on the table. Be like, what? You, what you've been reading is dog shit. Take, yeah. You would have gotten nowhere with them I if would, you try to change their mind. Because I'm trying to change that person's belief system. That takes years to change. And so this is why people are so polarized. They're not accepting of another person's belief system. Now, that person that would sit across from me, he'd look at me and he'd think, you're the bad guy. You're working for the bad guys. Look at what you've done. Look at all these things that are happening. Look at the chaos. You guys are the bad guys. And so I would always have to put that aside and allow them to feel that way. I mean, they would look at me. I remember one guy, he was he was great. He was polite and kind. I think we were even having pizza in the room because we were in there for a while. And he's like, you know, you're really great. He's like, but if I could kill you, I would. He's like, you're my sworn enemy. And, he, you know, I remember him sitting there at one point telling me how many Marines and soldiers he helped facilitate, you know, killings for. You have an address for this guy? <laughs> I don't know if he's actually still alive. Let's hope not. That's my own personal belief just coming out. That's my inside voice on the outside. But when you're in the room, I can't. And that was the thing I would have to disconnect from that. I could not sit yeah. and be upset over it. I would say, all right, that's your belief system. I understand. And in the, the end of the, the day, I need information from you, and I would do whatever I needed to get that info. And look, of course I feel passionately about it. I, As you know, 9-11, I survived yeah. a massive terrorist attack. But you have to put, to put that part of you aside. That is my belief system. My belief system was terrorism is wrong, this is wrong, you don't do this, you don't do these things. That person's belief system is quite different. But you, if you try to change everybody's mind, you're just going to, it's a waste of time. Yeah. No, it basically looks and sounds like people arguing on the internet. That's what it looks like when you can't get out of out of your own way and you can only see the world through your belief system and are unwilling to put it to the side. I'd imagine that people sit down with serial killers or pedophiles or any type of predator. They have to do the same thing. Love that. 
I would love those to sit across people like that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I would, I was, I still do. I think I would too for a totally different reason. <laughs> like turn the cameras off and like everybody leave for a little bit. No, <laughs> I hey, look. You know what? It's to me, it was fascinating to understand the mindset of the person across from me. And I will give kudos to the U.S. Secret Service. After I went to poly school, they offered me the opportunity to get a master's in forensic psychology. And they said, look, if you're going to be talking to people, I know, you know, we know we taught you our way of interviewing people, the DOD way of interviewing people. By the way, nonviolent. I was never allowed to put hands on anyone. I, mine was all It's verbal. not effective anyway, really. Oh, that is a whole other conversation. It is not effective. Put a pin in that. It's effective at eliciting information. Whether or not that information is valid is a completely different bucket. There, there's a whole issue. So in 2009, when Obama stepped in to say, we're not going to be using torture or doing this to people because there's no science behind it. CIA wasn't doing their own interviews at the time. And do you know that we historically have not done any work in the United States, research or anything with regard to how to interview people, the system that we use in the U.S., and even in law enforcement, it was created in the 1940s. It was created in the 1940s by a criminologist who used his experience in the interview room. And so what they did is they went from third degree, which was hitting people, right, to interviewing people, but being able to use deception and other manipulative techniques. Over the years, it's 2021, we have yet to advance in the way we do interviews on people. And How so- How is that possible? It's possible because the community doesn't look at it as if it's important, and it is, because when you have a crime, right? You have a crime, this is our crime scene. Kind of looks like one a little bit, Andy. That's all right. The camera <laughs> angles only capture you and I. Nobody can see what <laughs> else is on the table. They can see what's on the sides. <laughs> so when you have a crime, you go to the crime scene, you look for evidence. If I have the gun, if I have fingerprints, and if I have all these things, then yes, I can solve the crime. But let's say I don't have any of these things. How do I solve a crime? How do I create new leads? By? Interviewing people. Interviewing people. But if you're not teaching people, law enforcement, to interview properly, they're not going to get the leads. They're not going to get the information. They're not going to know what to do. But they think they know what to do. And so there's been almost this, it's called an accusatory style of interviewing, where I come into a room, and I believe you did it, and I use this style to get a confession from you. I basically use a system and I accuse you of doing it until you confess. The problem is I come in with confirmation bias. Confirmation bias means because I believe you did it, anything you say to the contrary, I'm not going to hear because I believe you did it. And so even when you give me information that says he didn't do it, I'm going to automatically dismiss that because it does not fit the narrative of what I want. And so now you have people giving confessions in the interview room. Forget torture, right? Put that aside. Yeah. It, you have people giving confessions. You have you use it on young people. Young people are very easily influenced. And also they have, the majority of young people look at law enforcement with trust. And they think, oh, this person's not trying to manipulate me or deceive me. I can I can believe in them. I can trust in them. So it, it causes serious problems with young people. A lot of people have mental health issues because quite a few of them commit crime. And then also people who are very weak-willed, you'd be amazed as to how you can get somebody to confess or to agree or to even give an admission to something. I know most people- That they didn't do is that, what you're saying. That they did it. You can get a person- depending on their character or how weak-willed they are, you can get people to give false confessions. And they happen, and we see it now. We see people now being exonerated because of the DNA evidence. The science has, has advanced there, and so now we're exonerating people, and it's a portion of them are people who gave false confessions. And people are kind of like scratching their head, saying, how did you get, you got a confession? And the confession is the gold stamp. It, it was the seal. My goal every time I walked into an interview room was to get a confession. You get the confession, your case is done, even if I have no ev evidence. And so, at least for me, I can only speak for me, because of the weight of it, I never wanted to send somebody to jail, to prison. And not that I would send them, but I never wanted to, to sway someone to have them give me that information. And now I've affected this person's life completely. I really almost erred on giving them the benefit of the doubt rather than the other way around, even when I did my polys. If I always had a 
you know, in my mind, I remember thinking, if somebody fails my poly, they deserve to fail my poly because I really gave them every possibility. I would skew somebody inconclusive in a polygraph, which would mean I'm not, they didn't pass, they didn't fail. So I could give them another one or bring them in a different day instead of skewing like, well, they look like they're failing. I'm just going to fail them. Could you change the outcome of a poly if you went into it with that accusatory um, yes. interview style? Just the way that you ask the questions to elicit that yes. physical response? Yes. You can speak to someone in such a way where they're so now sensitive to the topic that they will feel it. So, for example, when I would poly someone, sometimes the agents I worked with would go, they would work a case, bring somebody in, they talk to the person for a bit, and then they come find me like, hey, he's not talking. Do you want to give it a shot? Give him a poly. And I would say no. I said, you've been talking to him for about an hour. He's keyed up. He's going to fail it. It's not fair to him. Let him go or let him sit in his cell for a little while and then bring him in on a day. I want nobody to speak to him and then have him sit in my room because you can sensitize someone. I could also, Andy, influence you in such a way in the room if I'm not ethical, and we know that some people are not ethical, if I'm yeah. not ethical, I can skew you to fail the test. So I will give the Secret Service, they really worked very hard to make sure that they picked the most ethical people to hire and the most ethical people to do polygraphs. We were only 30 in the unit out of, I think it was 5,000 employees. And you really had to be careful and to be sure. But you can absolutely skew somebody. Can you skew somebody it. the other way? Could you skew them to pass as well? I think that's harder. Because most people, when they come in, they're worried, they're stressed out, they're nervous. Even even if I, so let's say I ask you the question, did you kill yes. that person? <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> maybe That's how you pass, right? You just give ridiculous answers? <laughs> like before they're even, like, maybe. <laughs> did you ever take a polygraph? You would yeah. be the worst person to give one to. I did. Were you a wise ass in the room? Uh, do you not know me? <laughs> you were a wise ass in the room. I you? was as professional as humanly possible. So there was still a shred of being a wise ass. There was. How many have you taken? Just one. Was it? It was not a lifestyle. It was more like, hey, it was, a, I forget what it was. There's, so there are clearances and jobs where you would have to go and get a lifestyle poly where they're going to ask you much more personal questions. This one, pretty sure it was for. National security. That's it was for a security clearance or a, a, a read-in program. And it was like, hey, have you, are you a, meanwhile, I'm active duty military. Like, are you an enemy of the United States of America? And in my head, I'm literally thinking like, oh my God, I want to say yes to this question just to see what this person does. Obviously the answer is no. It's like, fuck, of course not. Like, why are you asking me this? It was questions like that. So those are the national, so there's two two versions. There's a lifestyle one that you spoke yeah. about and then there's a national security one. And that's there's really- There's the one where fun. they're like, hey, have you ever stolen anything from work? And I was like, can you define that? Because <laughs> I might have some lithium batteries at the house that I didn't pay are for. Are you a liar? <laughs> are you a liar, Andy? Do you lie to your family members? Yes. Did you grow up lying to your mother? Yes. Oh. You'd feel my poly. No, I wouldn't. I lied all the time. I snuck out. The first, so when I was screening for uh, the East Coast, you go in and you see a shrink after you fill out that stupid bubble test where it's like, hey, is the pole vault, pole vault your favorite uh, televised event? And there's no yes or no. It's strongly agree, st strongly disagree. I think it's the Brooks Myers, whatever they call it. The Is that the one where it's like hundreds of questions? Oh, and they're all in you. Towards think, the end of it, you're like, you're asking me the yeah. same eight things 50 different ways. That's I think that's the MMPI, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. I had to take that for the NYPD, too. So the shrink or the psych, they talk to you first, and then you do an interview. And the guy goes, when was the last time you broke the law? And I sat there in my chair, and I was thinking about Five it. Five minutes ago. I, so I said, I said, maybe 20 minutes ago. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I wasn't following the speed limit on the way here. I was late. And he started laughing. He said, you have no idea how many people will sit here and say, I have never broken the law? I'm like, like never broken the law? He's I will have people sit here and say, I never break the law. He's like, well, what about jaywalking? They're like, no. <laughs> well, you know, like, <laughs> it's just like trying to sell it. I'm like, why would you do that? So yeah, if you would like ask me on a polygraph, uh, did I grow up lying to my mom? I'd be like, yeah, I did. I would lie to her about when I was coming home. I probably would lie to her about who I was hanging out with. I'd lie to her about whether or not my homework was done, whether or not I had gone to school, what I was doing if I didn't go to school. Like, I don't give a shit. Like, let's just get to the root problem here. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I should pass. I was telling the truth. You probably could pass. And that's the thing. A lot of people would hold on to information and they wouldn't share. And it's, it's often it would be, if you just tell me, 
you'd likely pass the poly, but they would hold on to something small or smoking pot or something like that. Yeah. Where it's to just say it, get it out. It, they would allow for a certain, at least when I went on, it was very strict. Now they allow for, they, there's a lot more flexibility in that area. Well, if they still want to get candidates and recruits, they might have to loosen it up a touch. We, they couldn't get people. <laughs> we, the majority of my app, because I did applicants as well. So yeah. there's crime. And then there's the applicant testing. When you do the applicant testing, you do national security, um, questions like the yeah. one you had taken, and you do lifestyle, which is, you know, crime, have you committed crime, drug use, or I would say experimentation because it sounded nicer for people. Um, Look at you skewing for an easier test. Well, what you do is, <laughs> here's a technique I'm going to teach you. Not that you you could care less because, and I... I, I love that about you. I would be the worst you. polygraph tester ever. I wouldn't even hook it up. I would just start asking questions. I think... And they're like, I'd be like moving the needle with my finger. You like, would oh, not. You know why you would not? Because even though you joke around, you you are a very ethical person. And I think because like when I would have applicants in that seat, I was an applicant and I took mine. Yeah, you could see it from their perspective. And you could see like th- they really want this job. And some people would come in and they're, this is my life dream to be a Secret Service agent. And now you just crush their dream because. But also, they also like crack cocaine, you know? So you have to get to the bottom of that. Can't do both. Can't do both. But the Weed, language. Maybe no crack cocaine. I think they. No, allow, don't you dare say that they. <laughs> yes. I think they may allow now Come on. for some other type <sighs> of narcotics. I think what it has to do now, again, when I went in, it was super, super strict. So obviously, they weren't hiring getting a lot of candidates. I think culturally society changed where people, more people are using or experimenting. So they do allow a little bit more of a variety now, yeah. I will say. There's probably a time limit associated with yes. that though. Yes, it's kind of, they look at it with time, at age, how much, you, when you did this. Yeah. So if so if you did something, maybe let's say when you're 18 and now you're 30 and you've not done anything, they look at it in a different way because the majority of people have experimented or used. Yeah. But the language... I know you hit me with the language, but language helps. So if I'm in the room and I'm just trying to get information, I also don't want to be all day there because somebody doesn't want to tell me they've done pot a couple of times. If you say experimentation, it sounds nicer, softer. If I say, did you use drugs? It sounds ugly. Never. Not now, a single time. So you're less likely to get people to say yes. Even when I did criminal polys, I would never say, I never said to anybody, if they were suspected of rape, I would never say, did you rape her? You know, did you hurt her? What happened? I would let them describe to me what they did. The word rape would never come out of my mouth. And they would never say it because nobody wants to be a rapist. As you're starting to get closer to those, I'll call them like a nexus question, like the root issue. Can you, are you watching their physiology react to that as well too, as you're getting closer to what it is that you're trying to actually get the answer for? No. So let me... I did do a good job here to explain how polys really work. If you remember yours, in the beginning you had a dialogue with them, yes? Yep. So you sit down, you're not hooked up, you're talking for about an hour, two hours maybe, they're breaking down the questions. Yours might have been a little bit faster. It wasn't that long. Yes. Because everybody there essentially had to go through the same thing. Yours might have been a little bit, probably a lot faster. There is a chance the machine wasn't hooked up. (laughs) I mean, I think they got through a lot of people that day. (laughs) <laughs> That's pretty. I would do one a day. I would do one a day. That's oh, how long mine was. certainly are. wasn't that procedure. I mean, at this time, though, I think I had a TSSCI clearance, as it was anyway, which that people who hear that will think it's a big deal. It's not. I, I, I submitted for that clearance to go to that command. They're like, what's well, going to take years? Here's your interim today. I'm like, this is very bizarre. I don't actually have the clearance, but I have this interim clearance, and I'm still going to be read into these programs absent the clearance anyway. And you'll backfill the, the you know, going and talking to your high school teachers and friends and stuff. I'm like, okay, that's, that's a little odd. Well, you know what? They use it as a formality. And sometimes it would happen, and you'd get someone that like, hey, get this person through. And I'd look at the, the boss or whoever, and I'd say, I don't get people through. Yeah, They have to get themselves through. But in some situations, they look at the poly as a formality. Hey, he passed the poly. He's good almost like that check mark, when I really think those, those interviews they should spend more time on. But probably, though, you're already in, you've been in, so they're looking at you in a different lens. When we would have applicants, well, I mean, I had to take polys after I had already been hired internally so I could get a higher clearance. Yeah. And so 
they're looking at you definitely in a different lens at that moment. But of of course, they're trying to make sure that you're not working with any enemies of the state. You're not talking to terrorists. You're not giving out, you know, U.S. secrets, all that stuff. But man, where are we going with this? You asked me How does question. poly work? You were going to explain to me, break down the process. So the beginning, the beginning part is them talking to you. So he talks to you so you can get it. You can understand how it works. You can answer the questions because when you finally get hooked up, you're not having a conversation. It's, you know, is your name Andy? No. Well, of course with you, (laughs) you know. What happens though if they answer that and it doesn't register as a lie? You're like, son of a bitch. I'm talking to an expert. You know, sometimes people, because they're so nervous, they will answer wrong. (laughs) <laughs> i've had i had people so it's like it's like comic relief with you oh i'm sorry i like to see people crack like that that shit's hilarious to me people would get stressed out you people would fall asleep in the chair they were so stressed out while they were speaking to me so they're talking to me they're stressed out they're having their you know we're going through the questions i'm asking them things the idea is in the beginning of the process i want you to tell me everything and then It's like, okay, you've told me everything. Anything else? No, we're good. Okay, have a seat. But they're so spent. By the time they get in the chair, you would have people fall fall asleep because they're just crashing. And so you just have to like nudge the chair. But when they're, when you would have them hooked up though, you ask them the question, then you would ask them the questions. And they're typically yes or no questions. Now, a lot of people don't like polys. I will tell you, I came across really fantastic liars. I truly believe in them. They really help. They're a great tool. Now, it's not going to tell you what the person is specifically lying about, but if I ask you a question and you pass all the other ones, but you hit this one, it's a great tool for me to understand Andy doesn't like this question. Now, it could be several different things or it could be something significant. And then I have the confidence and then to sit down with you to to sit and keep talking to you. Whereas otherwise, I don't know. Yeah. You people are different. It's I'm a I'm a trained lie detector. But even with that, there are some people, everyone's so unique, everyone's so different. Some people will look at you straight in the eye and swear up and down, "No, I didn't do this." Even though people who swear up and down, typically that's a sign of deception. Yeah. When people when you have those people that come in, "I swear to God, I swear on my children, I swear to this, God only knows anytime any type of divine entity comes in, huge red flag." Yeah, it seems like day one stuff. Depends. But if you're after information, so there's the applicant who you want to get through so they can get the job, which those are actually the harder polys because you're looking at somebody's whole life. Those are harder to do. Those took longer. Whereas if I was dealing with a specific crime, which I don't want to say enjoyed these, but I really liked sitting down with people and understanding who they are, where they came from, What are the choices? I would always have a moment where, what are the choices this person made to find themselves sitting across from a Secret Service agent about to take a polygraph test? And so you really hear people's stories. And some people had difficult stories. There were people where in in the room, I, I really empathized with them as to how they got to where they got. And then there are other people where the behavior was very deviant and but still, I'm not there to express my dislike or hate for the person. I think probably the ones that I would get the most grief on by my colleagues were the child pedophilia cases, cases that were especially sexual uh, abuse towards children. And those, it's not talked about a lot. Those happen quite a lot. And I think it's just a very hush-hush thing. We think it happens here or there, and they happen a lot. Yeah, I think they, well, I don't know if it would happen any less if it was more publicly discussed. Like maybe it would be harder to get away with or people would pay more attention to warning signs if there are any. I don't know. What's hard with kids is kids are very loyal to their parents, even in situations of abuse. Is it most of often abuse. a family member or a parent? It, I would say 50-50. Because usually it's someone who has access to the child. So it's a family member whether a parent, an uncle, or an uncle, you know, a friend, uncle so-and-so who's a friend of the family, it's always that type of, and I don't want to say, I'm saying males, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm stereotyping because it women, 
abuse children too, so I want to be... It's got to be the statistical minority, though, for women abusing kids. You know why? I think the number is actually higher for boys because most young men will not say anything because of the shame factor. So if you think women feel shame when they're assaulted and they don't say anything, can you imagine the shame young boys or young men feel? They don't say anything. And so they actually think that the number is much, much higher than it is because they're more, there's more shame. They don't want to say it. You know, when I was younger, this happened to me. Yeah. Damn. Look, I think it's a really important thing because this is how you find people. And usually with these cases, there's rarely one victim. And that's why you have to be very careful when you do your interviews because you think, oh, it's just this one kid. And meanwhile, with these cases, there's another 50 kids behind that kid. And so that's why interviewing, going back to what I was originally saying, is so important because it gives you, it opens the door to all this other information that you would never have. Do you know approximately 80% of all crime in the U.S., if we're looking overall crime, it goes unsolved? I did not know that. That seems exceptionally high. I'm saying overall crime. If we're looking at murder, homicides, maybe those very extreme violent crimes, those typically law enforcement will pull more, will put more assets to solving those. Those have a higher um, rate as far as being solved. However, if you're looking at all crime, robbery, assault, burglary, everything, the majority does, 80% does not get solved. A big reason is if I don't have the prints, if I don't have this right in front of me, that's why they have, that's why they call it 48 hours because it's either you have it or you don't then the next way to get information is to do interviews. And it's interviewing witnesses properly, interviewing suspects properly, interviewing victims properly. You can't interview somebody for 15, 20 minutes and be like, well, they don't have anything. Yeah, That's not the process. So there's this huge shift happening actually in the U.S. now to what they call science-based interviews being done because historically we've been doing this accusatory style of interviewing. And sadly, it's being taught, it's been taught mostly by private companies, and there's one private company, I don't want to say the name, but one private comp- company that actually trained me that has the monopoly over this. And so this is who's tre- teaching law enforcement to do interviews. Hmm. And so it just does not work. We, ha- we There's so many problems. And it's we've advanced in the sciences and the social sciences and psychology, and yet we're using an interviewing style that was created in the 1940s. That's crazy to me, the end, almost the end of 2021. It is crazy. Are you seeing a shift that you were saying uh, to go back when you're talking about the essays you'd have your students write about why they're coming into the criminal justice pipeline? Are you seeing a shift in their answers or have you over the last few years? Some of them will say, I think initially a lot of them were, I want to go into law enforcement. I want to be a cop. I want to be this. The, the one shift I have seen, the majority of them don't want to go into law enforcement anymore. They used to want to be police officers, um, agents or go into that field. Now you don't see police. I will see the, the majority of my students want to go from my class straight to the FBI. They think they're going to apply and get in. I mean, they're still cops, right? I don't think they, the public does not see them that way. Even though really? I think of them as, I mean, you're law enforcement. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah. But I think society has gotten a bit more that we want the instant gratification of I'm just going to go straight to there. Why can't I just go straight to there where there's a process? You don't go straight to going into an agency like the service or the FBI or the DA. You typically have to have some other type of experience. I had NYPD. And even with that, I had languages, which helped me. Um, Even before that, before I went to the NYPD, I actually went, I almost went into the Marines. I went to the recruiter's office and I was trying to figure out, I knew nothing about brain. It really wouldn't have been a good call for you. (laughs) I didn't know. So I go to the recruiter's office and he's like, young lady. (laughs) That should have been warning sign number one. Like, like, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong bill. So this is my appointment, right? I'm making an appointment to go. It was like off the college campus somewhere. Young lady, why why do you want to go to the Marines? I was like, sir, I hear that you're the best, sir. He's like, goddamn right, we're the best. So he's like, here's your date. Here's your test. Study this book. And I remember going in to take my test, but then right after an opening happened in the NYPD, so I ended up going going that route. But there's a process to go into these other, these agencies, these, I don't want to say they're elite agencies, but these just different agents, agencies. You have to have an advanced degree. I'll call them a national level agency. Federal agencies, yeah. right? So, but I see my students thinking, oh no, I'm not going to, 
I'm not going to be a cop. A cops, they look at being a police officer as it's like you're a peasant. Like this, you're on the street. It's, I'm not going to do that. I mean, not coming from a, a law, zero seconds of law enforcement experience, I would say, I bet you that boots on the ground first few years probably is the most invaluable time that you would have as a law enforcement officer getting an understanding or interfacing with people, getting a better understanding of crime or the reasons that people commit crime or dealing with people who are, you know what I mean? Just getting that robust dossier of experience and then going to that federal agency and taking that knowledge. I think it would be tough to skip that step. I'd say two to four years would be amazing for that. I look at my first two to four years in the SEAL community, absent that, that's where I learned the vast majority of my lessons. I made so many mistakes along the way, thankfully at a super micro level. I can't imagine just making those mistakes at that macro federal level. I think they need that time. You do. Well, the majority of police departments, I mean, typically almost all of them, as far as I know, you go to patrol first. You you start on patrol. I think you should. You should because you learn how to talk to people. You learn how to deal with people. And quite honestly, that's where the most action. So my students think, oh, I want to be a detective. Detectives sit behind a desk. They're not, they don't, they show up after Everything's happened. So typically it's the patrol officers that will have the most interaction with the public. And they also need the most training too because they're interacting with the public, talking to witnesses, getting information. So patrol, and I want to be, I didn't get to really do any patrol because I went from literally NYPD, I didn't stay very long, straight into the Secret Service. Patrol is huge, human interaction, dealing with people on the street. And so they typically require you to do that. And then again, I can only speak for the NYPD, you do patrol, and then you either put in for your sergeants to go for it to be a sergeant or to try to go be a detective. But it's invaluable. I talked with the guys. Um, it, there is a sheriff's office up here, and then so there's the Flathead Valley Sheriff, and then there's the Kalispell PD, the banter between the two of them at who is better at their job. And then, of course, you throw the firefighters into the mix, and it's just a hoot Listen to those guys talk. But the diversity of calls that they go on in a 24 – well, not a 24-hour. I think they're doing tens. It's crazy. Everything you just described from like chasing a drunk dude. Some, my buddy may or may not send me some amazing uh, like computer screens like naked man running through downtown. I'm like, don't like just that's not crime. Let that guy express Let himself. Let him live. Yeah. Or there was another uh, massive fight at the docks. Unconscious man laying on his back. I'm like, get there. for. I need footage. Like, get your ass up there. Fight that crime. Is this the thing you always post? I love that. You post. No, that's the, that. so the cops get pissed at me about that. Why? So it's the police blotter that I post because they strip out actu- all the actual crime and all they post is that, like, a cat was seen crossing the sidewalk <laughs> oh. or a so, missing cow. So the police officers, they'll hit me up. They're like, Hey, fuck you, man. Like this job's actually really hard. You're making it seem like all we do is look for missing cows. I'm like, no, I get it. These are hilarious though. Cause the person who writes it needs an award for however they write those things comedically. But the diversity of the shifts, I mean, they'll go to an accident scene and do body recovery or, you know, uh, the mortuary stuff, go to the family for a notification to a shoplifting, to a DUI, to an assault. And it's like, holy shit, man, this is a 10 hour time period. I mean, that I can't even imagine that over a few years, that level of experience of human interaction. Then you, like we were talking about, it lays that foundation to then level that up towards a federal agency. How you would do that without that is beyond me. It was interesting. You said something and it just popped into my head. The first, the first, I don't, first time I saw a dead body, you know, on the job, before I tell you, like, what was the first time you saw someone deceased? So what was it like for you? The first dead body I ever saw was a motorcycle wreck when I was pretty young. And both of his shoes were near the motorcycle and the body was about 100 yards down the road, face down. And it was covered, but there was uh, like, uh, I'd say probably like kneecaps and below sticking out, shoeless, obviously. So that was the first dead body that I ever, ever saw. And then... In the military, I mean, post 9-11, there's not a lot of time to sit and process. Right. Uh, it's, it was more of a, it was a very rote thing, even when it came to the documentation afterwards, because there's a, a pretty large documentation process that people don't probably realize because they don't see it in the movies. It's not just like running through a target. And by the way, 99.9% of targets are not kinetic in any way, shape or form. It's like the wrong house in the wrong city looking for the wrong dude. But the ones that are 
kinetic. You're moving through as fast as you can to secure it. And then it's very systematic going back and documenting because now there's shooter statements and all that stuff. But I it was it was just kind of rote and systematic. I think I thought more about the the guy on the motorcycle than anything overseas, to be honest. Can I ask you a question? And this is where I don't have knowledge in this area. When you shoot, shoot somebody in theater, and let's say mm -hmm. it's accidental, right? Or it's you a, accidentally <laughs> shoot somebody. I, you shoot this the wrong, story is going down an interesting well, path. Well, <laughs> well, I'm asking: is it do those when those happen, or let's say? What it's, do you mean by accidental? I don't know. I guess like, oops, I came off safe and pulled the trigger on. Well, my how M4. do you know? Okay, I know, and and I'm not trying. I don't mean to be ignorant yeah. here. How do you know? Let's say you're looking for this specific person. Yes. And you think it's a specific person, or you go to the wrong house. Do the I guess what I'm asking is, do those mistakes happen where, or are you do you? So you're not. So there's. It's not like a targeted assassination. You'll see and hear people throwing around the term, you know, capture kill to define the mission set that we would be tasked with doing. And I don't. I don't personally. And I'm not saying that this isn't the case or it hasn't happened. I don't ever remember somebody saying, "Hey, this is a capture kill." operation. We would have a template of the person that we were looking for. And whether we were at the right target or the wrong target, you know, you have to meet one of two criteria, hostile act or hostile intent. Hostile act obviously being uh, picking up a weapon and pointing it at you or shooting at you. That's a very cut and dry. Hostile intent can get a little bit more gray. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's a woman carrying an ammo can who is trying to run across the street and provide ammunition to somebody that's shooting at you. Is she directly engaging you? No, so there's no hostile act, but the intent. So if you meet one of those two criteria, you have under the ROEs, or the ROEs that I operate under, you have the legal authority to execute legal action, or not legal, uh, lethal action. So if we would go to a target that, let's say it was uh, the wrong house, and an individual, um, you know, sometimes we would not, you know, surround and do a call out and pull them out of the building. And sometimes we would breach the front door and we would go running in like idiots. If we go running in like idiots and it's the wrong house and they pick up an AK, they're going to get shot. So it's not accidental. It's that before and even so let's say uh, we know exactly who we're looking for and we it, it would be almost impossible to visually identify them. By the way, most of the times we had the pictures that we would carry in our little football sleeves was a black silhouette. That was the most current picture that we had, which was no picture whatsoever. So I'd like draw a little mustache on them and stuff like that. But let's say we could visually identify them. You can't just shoot them just because you know who they are. If they do not have a hostile act or hostile intent, they're going to get cuffed and they're going to get taken back and turned over. So I wouldn't necessarily say the people who got shot on target that it was not the right target it wasn't accidental they met one of those two criteria and it was just extremely unfortunate that we ended up there but what about situations because i'm thinking i'm paralleling to law enforcement mm -hmm. where an officer shoots someone they think the person has a gun but they don't have a gun so I, in, that does happen for sure so that in my mindset those are accident yeah i would think of them that that way when that happens how does how does that go down it really is going to depend on the situation and i would say it's going to happen a lot less. Law enforcement, from my perspective, again, with zero seconds in law enforcement, is much more reactionary than we had to be overseas. Plus, we had tools that allowed us to completely unlevel the playing field. The main ones would be night vision goggles. I can see really clearly at night, and most of the places that we were going had no source of illumination, either inside or outside. And if they did, we're talking like a light bulb hooked up to an old car battery. So, I had the ability to move and put myself in a safe place to really determine whether or not they had something in their hand. Um, but if I'm on target, let's say I'm in a security position and I'm looking down a hallway, if somebody comes out in the middle of the night in a dark hallway and decides to raise their hand at me, they're getting shot immediately. I'm not even going to take the time to look and see what's in their hand, most likely, just because that to me is a hostile act. Um, and it's not a normal behavior. It's not a behavior that somebody would normally take. Another one would be but you would be okay if it, let's say there was nothing in the hand and you took the shot. You would be, you would, then would be all you'd be I, covered. I don't know what the word would be, but I can't answer that specifically because it there it's really going to depend. Um, it's going to depend on the theater that you are in. It's going to depend on the um, the specific ROEs. It's probably going to depend on the threat level of the target itself. Are we going after some financier who has? no direct ties to doing anything kinetically versus uh, a known suicide cell. You know, you're gonna, you know what I mean? It might be right. difficult. And 
broadly though, under the ROEs, I could articulate that where it met the criteria for hostile intent. Uh, another one is, you know, what do you do? Like when I used to wear my stuff overseas, I looked like I came from fucking outer space, right? I had tubes on my head. I had body armor on, I had radio antennas. I had guns with stuff all over it. I was wearing uh, a military uniform that was not something that these people would normally see. And you'd get situations most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time we'd land in a helicopter and people will run away from you, which is exactly what I would do if an alien spaceship landed outside. I'd be like, peace out. I would probably try to trip you so they would have somebody in between me and their spaceship so they would take you and your husband and I would get away scot-free. That's the normal reaction. They wouldn't know that it was a helicopter in some of those situations. Probably, those but okay, wow. a flying device that they don't understand lands somewhere very close to where they are. The likelihood of somebody running at that helicopter versus running away from it, again, gets you into this place. What do you do? What do you do if somebody's running at a helicopter? What do you do if somebody's running at a helicopter towards one of the flight control services that you need for that helicopter to actually be able to work like the tail rotor on a little bird. What do you do then? It's again, I can precisely that's hard to answer. Broadly, you could cover yourself under hostile intent because why would you do that? The normal human reaction is to run away from that or to maneuver away from that or put something in between you, not going to fall on sprint towards it. So again, impossible to, to answer precisely, but yeah. broadly, you're likely going to be able to be covered under the ROEs of uh, hostile intent. You know, it's interesting because I think you are right, because I think probably in theater, because you have, you're dealing with more. It's not as reactive as law enforcement. It's much more proactive. I also think, though, law enforcement, if we go back to originally what we're saying, they typically don't deal with. You're not dealing with a lot of, you deal with difficult people, you deal with the public, but yeah. you don't, you're not discharging your weapon often, if ever. You're not. Which is a good thing. Which is a good listening. thing. But what happens is that means there's a lack of experience, less experience, which makes you more reactive. Well, they're also not dealing with people who are rigged up with suicide vests. You know, right. Because that is a situation that I know has happened more than once where people had those helicopters land and people. They, I mean, we've encountered people who are sleeping in those things, suicide vests, suicide belts. So that's a big issue. I mean, that's something that you can't visually determine because it might be underneath their clothing. Somebody running at a helicopter, if you don't take that action, you might lose that asset and everybody on board that asset as well. We would, we would actually, we did a lot of training with that because obviously after I did my investigations, I went to the president's detail. I mean, even now the, the other individuals we, we protected, but especially after 9-11, one of the big things we were worried about were, were suicide yeah. deaths. And we would always try to come up with ways, one, to identify a person, you know, wearing it. Like, how would you know in the public? <sighs> Good luck with that. Some of the stuff that they taught us, and I don't know how accurate it is. It's, you know, the uh, smell the scent of the the oils or whatever the the device depend on what it's made of yeah wires hanging out the person you know perspiring the any freshly cl uh, shaven clean face um the certain stare like there were certain things they gave us a checklist to the best of their ability to say look this is if you see this behavior it was more behavior what were you supposed to do if you saw that behavior what's the threshold for the secret service to come out of their holster and drop somebody well, you have to be a really good shot because you have to shoot him. Why? What if it's a suicide belt? That's a good point. Well, what you'd you know what we know. did? We you well, never know though. What so, yeah, about probably, suicide phones? Because there was um, suicide phones. I would just call them. No, 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 no. We would when we did rope lines. One of the concerns we had was individuals having devices and putting some type of explosive oh, sure. device in their cell phone or in their electronic device and putting it in the president's face. So that was one of the things that was a huge issue for us when iPhones came out. What's the rule on that? Um, are people allowed to have stuff in their hands that close to the president, like when he'll walk the line like that? What they do is- Because I know somebody is always watching the hands of the people, if not multiple people watching the hands, but- So you will have the agents, the shift that's next to the president, left and right. Uh, those people will typically be screened. So before they actually came through, their device would probably have been looked at. Mm -hmm. um, there's also- individuals behind them so you don't have like this flux of like a mosh pit type of thing you if you have people in that front you know handshake line the rope line 
Usually we know who they are. They're selected. It's not random, although it looks random on TV. Yeah. They're sort of people that are connected to somebody at the event. And we do that strategically because we really don't want that you don't want the president just shaking whoever's hand, even though you really want him to, you really want to pick people that have been vouched for that you know are okay. So they're fine with like holding the, you know, the classic iPhone up in well, that front section? What we do when you work shift, when you we take the hands and we shove them down. And so the things we do is I will take that person's hands and literally lock them down. Um, or, you know, we, we knock anything out of their hands. If their hands are in their pockets, because we always say hands out of your pockets, hands out, hands out where we can see them. And some people will be wise you know, asses and won't do that. You'll you'll grab their wrists and just lock them down till mm-hmm. the president goes by. So you really don't want them touching or having their hands up. So those are, you're essentially slapping people down, but more tactical way yeah. so that those devices don't come up. But with suicide vests and all that, you would have your magnetometer checkpoints. And this was always a point of contention because whenever there were these big, especially during campaigns, when there were these big events where donations were being given by very influential people, I would always push my magnetometers, which is my, uh, I think m- most people know what that yeah. is, right? I would push my mags further out from the event. So that way, if somebody did come up with a suicide vest, because that's what I was worried about, if they did detonate, it would not hit the inside of the event. And again, of course, my overall goal was to protect the president always. And then uh, you you are also responsible for the lives of all these people but because he's the threat. He's the target. And you're bringing the target to a public place. And you're exposing the target to the public. And now these people are also susceptible. A lot of people don't think of it that way. I always thought of yeah. it that way because now it's not just his life. All the other lives around him, you're responsible for that. So the idea is if I've done my job correctly and I have my magnetometers and I have my area locked out, if there is a suicide vest or suicide bomber or situation like that, it will be outside of my security point. Now, if some, for some random reason he's walking down the street, which you don't see, you would you would shoot and you would evacuate. That those would be the those would be the primary things. You know, take the threat out and then evacuate. Has there been a lethal use of force by the Secret Service at one of those type of events? There have been historically. I can't tell you right now. I know there have been historically. Reagan not, got shot getting into his... No, he got shoved into the limo after he got so, shot. But they didn't... The Secret Service actually didn't shoot back there, right? They kind of dogpiled him? The, so everybody has their own function. When you're yeah. shift, your shift, your function is to block. So I'm not going to go towards the threat. I see the threat, you know, the threat coming towards the president. I'm going to jump in front of that threat. Like really that's what you're, you're yeah. a shield at that point. When it gets to that level, if it, if it breaks all your security barrier, barriers, at that point, I need to block the bullet from hitting the president, which is if you look at the, the, the video of it, mm-hmm. you'll see the one agent, which was the detail leader, push the president into the car. And then the other agent that was with the president, he got up and he actually made himself big. One of the things they teach us, which is counterintuitive, is you actually not only just get up there, you make yourself big. You make yourself big enough so that you can block the bullet and essentially make sure you get shot so it doesn't bypass you and hit the person behind you, the president. I hide behind shit. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> and I he's can like, hide this behind isn't the job small for me. rocks. I can get in little holes. I can get very small. When you're getting shot at, you probably oh, hell can. Yeah. I just hide really behind small. shit. But what's interesting, so he got shot during an arrival and departure. Mm-hmm. So arrival and departures are the most vulnerable things. What one of the learning lessons was is the president is secure in the White House or inside a structure, right? And he's secure in his vehicle, the beast. But he's not secure. The mo- Where he's most vulnerable is when he's moving, mean, meaning moving from the White House to the beast, moving from the beast to a location. And so the learning lesson from Reagan shooting was that arrivals and departures are the are where the president is most vulnerable. And so now today you you will rarely see every every arrival de- departure is tented and covered and secured. Yeah. So you actually typically aside from Air Force when he's getting on Air Force One or Marine One where they're on a military yeah, base a typically huge or it's huge or it's an airport and it's really locked down that t- typically Arrival and departures are covered. So one of the things I would do when I was, we called it a site agent, I would make sure I would, you would, you would order these huge, huge tents and block everything off 
and then put your sniper counter snipers, excuse me, in strategic positions and lay out a security plan because that's where the most vulnerable. So what is the ROE that the Secret Service operates under, though? With regard to what? Taking another life. It's pretty much almost like law enforcement. It's it's either um, you know imminent threat. Yep. You know, or th- that's really it. It's either I feel you know, am I in danger if someone's shooting at me? If then you have the green light to take take a shot, and it's either myself or the person I'm protecting or another person. I had the same. I had to abide by the same ROEs as law enforcement. You are law enforcement. You're called. I was a uh, eighteen eleven. So criminal investigator, but you, we had to operate by the same ROEs. Now, if somebody, but the same thing goes for the person I'm protecting. So use of force was based off of that. Either there's a threat or an imminent threat, and then you would take action. But you had to be sure. But yeah. that, that threat had to be there. It can't be, you know, oh, oops. It's a wild job you guys did. Did I ever tell you I hosted the Secret Service counter assault team? Cat. Yeah. No, I believe that. I think you did tell me. Yeah. What did you, did you do training with them? Yes, I hosted them for, uh, I think it was just over a week. They came down to the kill house on the East Coast and did some room clearance stuff. They were explaining to me, like, they're like, we're in the box. I'm like, no, you're in a building. They're like, no, it's an internal term. I'm like, God <laughs> damn it, use the Navy terms. <laughs> oh, because of the way they spoke. The way they spoke, and I didn't realize the different conditions of their weapons, where they could have a round of the chamber, where they could not have a round of the chamber. I was surprised by it. They... You can have a round in the chamber. Well, I was talking with them, it, especially in a training environment. They had a very oh, okay. Training. It was a it was a different lead up process to say entering the house. I guess maybe we had a much much more relaxed style at the uh, the command that I was at at the time. Uh, but it, just in talking to them, it, law enforcement is more constrained than the military. Yes, overseas, and I'll leave it at that. There was some differences in how they did business. Yes, I um, mean we were. I always had a round in the chamber, always. Uh, all, yep. our, all our weapons, we would gun box them. We called it gun boxing. And all our weapons are... Gun boxing? Did you actually put it in a box? I don't know why it was called that. It was called gun box your weapons. Interesting. Yeah, I would hope you have a round in the chamber. All, everything, all our all unloaded our weapons. gun has the same effective yeah. range as a framing hammer. You might as well just carry a tool belt around if you're going <laughs> to not carry one in the chamber. Yeah, no, I mean, everything. We had, we had different types that we had for different scenarios and situations, but they were all always properly... Did they ever give you an Uzi? No. And, you know, please forgive me. I don't speak very good weapons. I mean, I had my sidearm, which was yep. my SIG. Um, I was trained in using shotguns. We would typically take the shotguns when we would do for indoor um, yep. and inside structures, inside buildings. And then we had a submachine gun as well. You probably had MP5s. It was MP5. Yeah. It was. Uh, Uzis look cool. But I don't know if I could hit you with one from right where I am right now. MP5s. Yeah, the worst. <laughs> MP5s were, we, we, I mean, we would use them, shoot them in, you know, automatic. I always, you know, I would watch movies and you see them shooting automatic weapons. Think, wow, that yep. looks easy. Shooting automatic for me was difficult. I had a harder time. Even with the MP5, a nine mil round? On, on the, yeah, because of the momentum. I don't know. I, I didn't like auto. I mean, I would like, we had, it let you do bursts. So I like the bursts. Three rounds. Yeah. I always tell people there's two types that use full auto. They're actors and assholes, <laughs> neither of which can hit anything with an actual gun. So now I don't know. Uh, we had automatic weapons overseas, obviously the heavier guns, but it's for fire suppression. So you can actually gain some space to maneuver. If I mean, I only carried. Could you explain that to me? So, like, we had, you know, 7.62. When I first got in, there was M60s, and then I, uh, what did they switch to? Same same cartridge, but different type of weapon system, or we'd have 50 cals. And they're not, I mean, I guess you could put an opt- optic on them, and you could be precise, but it'd have to be your first round. Because beyond that, you're dealing with the recoil, the rise of the of the barrel. So... It's a larger round, so you can have a heavy volume of fire. So let's say you get shot at, right? The first Mm -hmm. rule of a gunfight is, first off, win the gunfight. But you do that by overwhelming fire superiority. So if they shoot at you, you unload at them back, mostly with those heavy weapons, so one element can maneuver. You're not going to maneuver while the other people are shooting at you. You're going to break off into two pieces. You'll have a you know a supporting element, a maneuvering element. These people will shoot. These people will maneuver. They'll shoot. They'll maneuver. It can go in a... A variety of directions, but those heavy weapons, they're not designed for very precise shooting. That's why everybody else has, I mean, I had on my M4, I don't think we had, we didn't have burst. It was safe, semi, and full. And 
the only time I ever flipped it to full was by accident. And then I would flip, flip it back because you just can't hit anything the after accuracy. the first round. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, up close, sure, uh, I guess. But then you're wasting ammunition. It's You're better off taking a well-aimed shot. Yes. But those heavy gunners, talking about getting people's heads down, those are the tools to actually get people's heads down. And then you maneuver. So that's how we use them. Yeah. It'd be sweet if the Secret Service had M60s. You know, you had to, one of the things with shooting, they really were, the idea was you're, we're probably going to take a shot in a public place. Yeah. And so the accuracy of your shot was, it's always important, of course, but when you're in a congested area, a very heavy populated area, if you think of these events where, I remember one event I did, and I don't even re- remember where it was. I did so many of these. I did one event, President Obama was speaking. It might've been during his 2012 campaign thousands of people gathered in this field and I remember I had to like create these uh, just d- design in such a way where we could create evacuation routes too before people and how you're going to jam these people in and barricade everything and but think of a uh, you know him working a rope line or him being around those people and you having to take a shot it's a because it's a nightmare it is yes it, it, it is one of the worst situations to be in and that was always one of the things that they really hammered shooting for us because typically they, when we would shoot, if we were shooting someone, it would be in a really congested place, and you don't you don't want to miss that. You can't you can't miss that shot. You cannot make a mistake. Yeah, that would be a rough one. Well, I'm glad you never had to. Me too. How's the law enforcement doing in New York right now? Didn't they get rid of qualified immunity? I don't know. I know they were talking about that. I think it passed. You. Are the professor. Do you want to explain qualified immunity? Or I can completely butcher it. Butcher it. Uh, isn't it? So my understanding of qualified immunity is that the officers are essentially covered by a blanket, if you will, by the department. So an individual officer cannot be, is it civilly or criminally sued. charged? Yes. Sued. For something that may occur on the job. So by removing that, that opens up individual officers to be sued for things that they do in the execution of their job, which for me, if I was an officer, would motivate me to do absolutely nothing. Yes. So you are correct. So when you are a police officer, when something happens, a shooting or an incident happens, they don't sue you. They sue the NYPD. So the NYPD is the one who pays out in lawsuits. Typically what what happens is there's two ways you can go about it. You you can, you typically first, they criminally try to go after the police officer for whatever he or she did. And you can either charge that police officer crimin- criminally or not. But regardless of whichever way that goes, you can, at the same time, you can also file a civil suit, which means you sue. But historically, you don't sue the officer. You don't sue me, Evie. You sue the NYPD and the NYPD pays out. Now with this, what they're saying, this is very difficult, and I don't know what type of applicants they're going to get because you're not, why would I want to be in law enforcement putting me in a situation where I'm interacting with people, there is conflict, things are going to happen, and now not only am I putting my life on the line, and I'm dealing with individuals who don't always comply, who fight back, now not only that, you're going to be able to sue me, Evie, and take my house and my car. Why would I want to do that job? Or imagine if you're 10 years... Well, what's the pension in law enforcement? NYPD was, when I first started, it was 20 years. Now it's 25. It depends on the department, so well, 25. Well, let's say you're 12 and a half years into that, and then they change that rule. I mean, how Are does you that... grandfathered into the old one? I don't know. <sighs> let's say you're not. I mean, how is... I mean, I can't even imagine being motivated to really step into much of anything. You know what they're going to do now? They're going to have supplemental insurance because I had that. Because I didn't didn't trust anything. The officers will individually have to go out and get their own? I think they're going to get insurance. I had insurance. Remember we talked about it on our last podcast, the first one we did together. We talked about insurance? We did. We We got off the rails. You don't remember anything. You don't remember anything, Andy. So I I had- some things. (laughs) I had insurance. When I was in law enforcement- I had insurance. I paid insurance for if something happened and somebody tried to sue me or the Secret Service didn't back me up in anything, I had insurance and I paid every year my insurance and that was for 
civil suits and it was also for representation. So I could have somebody represent me should the Secret Service say, you know what, Evie, we think that that's a bad shoot. That's the term they would just use. Yeah. That it's unjustified or it's a bad shoot. You're on your own. And so because of that, I always had insurance. So I think what's going to happen now is you're going to see law enforcement officials. I think this is, I should probably invest in this actually now that we're talking about it. You're going to see now this escalation. They're going to create insurance plans for law enforcement where they pay per year. And if something happens, they're covered. Almost like the way you have car insurance, house insurance. That's what they're going to end up doing. I just feel like the job is hard enough as it is. Like it just, I don't know. It is hard. It is thankless, but you do it. Look, I did it because I didn't want... You want to help people. I love the idea of serving something greater than myself. And I don't really understand it. I couldn't articulate it when I was younger why I wanted to do it. I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to leave something behind. You know, you always think I'm going to be 80 years old one day. I'm going to sit in my rocking chair and I just want to feel that I did something. And that's how I felt. And there's that part of it, being of service of something greater than yourself. And at the same time, it is a camaraderie. It is working with people, having, it's your, it becomes your family. Yeah. I spent more time with my colleagues and my peers and my family. And that you are family in it. There's something quite extraordinary in knowing that this person has my back, literally. And with that, you become strong. Think about this. Think about the advantage we have. We were always around a group of like-minded people, brave people, strong people, for the most part. I know there's those stragglers. I worked with some idiots. Yeah. And some I, people might have looked at me and been like, oh, you're an idiot. <laughs> so I don't think that, that I don't think that's true about you at all. But you never know. Well every high performing team has their bottom ten percent, Evie. Yes, but you're not it because I've maybe mm-hmm. not tactically work with you, but I've worked <laughs> with you. <laughs> don't underestimate my, my ability to be an idiot. Yes. Well it's your humility and it's your sarcasm. <laughs> But think about how fortunate we were that we always had that group of people around us. Now think about how many people never have that. They never have that around them. So that's why when people are very fearful or afraid or unsure of themselves, of course they are. They've never had, it's like you've got your own, your crew of people who give you more strength, give you, make you bolder. And you don't realize this is happening to you, but how you're very, we're very fortunate to have had that. Whereas... The majority of the population doesn't have that. Sometimes people will ask me, you know, how can I find people that, you know, can elevate me or make me feel better or just braver? You know, how do I expand my circle? And I often think, I'm like, that's, wow, I don't know. That's a really hard thing to do. Well, I never had to think about that because of the the job that I have, I had, the, the circle I was able to be in, I was very fortunate. So I think that's one of the most amazing things and of being in the job that I had you know, having come from that place because of, I got to work with other Secret Service agents and very smart people, very brilliant people, very strong people. And you are what you you are around. If you're around buffoons, you're, you're going to be a buffoon. If you're around people who do make dumb decisions and do do inappropriate things, you're, you're just, no matter how strong your identity is, you become what you surround yourself with. And so I think that's probably one of the things that I'm most thankful for. That's what I miss the most, actually. Yeah. The execution of the job was exciting at times and miserable at times and extremely boring at times. But the people were awesome, for sure. What are your thoughts on them uh, limiting the restraint ability of the officers? I think the vascular, what do you guys call it? Vascular compression, also known as a choke hold or a rear naked choke. And then I think they also remove their ability to apply any pressure to the back or chest of somebody they're trying to detain. I, you know, I think it depends on the departments. Each department is doing its own thing. Because remember, we talked about them. All, the thing with the departments are all autonomous. So unless they, but be, NYC, I'm talking specifically NYC. NYC. Yeah, there was a big reform of, and a removal of what I'm going to call a tool from the officers. Um, I have my own personal thoughts on them, but I'm curious, since you guys were in law enforcement, what your thoughts are. I feel that they're making it harder to do the job. Yeah, and I think that there's this loss of understanding. Maybe this common sense loss, you're dealing with people who fight back and you're making it very hard to not just do your job, but you're making it also hard for you to survive. I also think that most officers, not all, they need to put more emphasis on their own personal training. They need to train harder. You can give somebody uh, 
you can give somebody the the knowledge and understanding of the tools, but if you don't do, take ownership of it, like you could explain to somebody the theory of marksmanship with a pistol. If you don't go to the range and actually practice marksmanship, you're going to suck, especially under stress. Um, do, you know, do you know how many times, I don't know if it changed now, how many times you qualified in the MIPD when I went in? Probably twice a year, and I'd say probably 50 rounds a time. Once a year. Yeah, that's insane to me. I would, you would shoot in training? Yeah. And then you would qualify once a year. Because, but here's the thing. I hear you saying that it's insane. I'm talking specifically about... Fighting, technique, tactics. They don't teach you <sighs> they're that. A bit, well, here's the I deal, I mean, they teach, you, they teach you in the academy, and they, then that's it. Yeah, but at the same time, 24 hours a day, you're not wearing your belt and, and shield. And if you know in the execution of your job that you might likely have to put your hands on somebody, you better fucking know what to do if you have to put your hands on somebody. And... A lot of the, again, the videos that are highlighted because it draws people attention and the people that are, are highlighting it or the organizations don't want people to change the channel are people who are well beyond their capability from a knowledge understanding. They're completely amped out of their mind. And it's and it would be, and again, I'm making this assumption watching these videos as well. They're not trained and they're not taking ownership over the fact that they, they need to be trained. Like the NYPD is not going to be able to 100% prepare you for the things that you're going to experience on the job. But every law enforcement officer I know, I'll ask them, I'm like, you know, in the last shift that you did, did you have to touch somebody? Every one of them says yes, yes. every time. Whether it's just like, hey, <laughs> chest cam footage is hilarious. Um, Let's just say sometimes people share it with me. My favorites are the drunks, and they're like trying to run away while they're still seat belted into their car. It's amazing. And then they'll get out, and it, if something as simple as just grabbing the back of the arm and directing them to the back mm -hmm. of the car very yes. gently. But you're still touching somebody. And, the, and when you do that at that range, if somebody's going to go berserk on their worst day and they think they're going to prison for the rest of their life because you don't know who you're dealing with, and you also don't know how to handle that and deal with that, that's how those videos occur and those those videos that highlight those really negative things i mean i spend on average two hours a day with some of my best friends simulating murdering each other we will air choke each other we will blood choke each other that we will take our joints right to the point where they're about to break and there's obviously an immense amount of trust in this training environment but doing so hour after hour after hour after hour you start to realize the utility and having an understanding of that knowledge and the ability to execute it, it's a tool that, I mean, if officers are listening to this and, and they're not taking their opportunity to enhance that that skill set as well, not only are they putting their own life at risk, they're putting their entire occupation at risk as well. I'm so tired of hearing people say, oh, I'm a game time player, I don't have to worry about it. Or like, I got a badge, yeah, they're gonna do what I say. Fuck you, they are. Like, let's get on the internet and I'll show you plenty of examples of people who aren't doing that and they're gonna have to take that ownership and do it in their own time. Um, but then it sucks because those negative examples, you watch the NYPD have that guidance where, hey, we're gonna remove all these tools for you. I would just, what I would really love is for the person that wrote that to go try to detain somebody who is completely and utterly against that actually happening. Like, here you go, you, here, here's the tool set that you're giving your officers, go have fun. Let me know how that works out for you. So, so there's a couple of things here. I, and I do agree with you when I, when I was in law enforcement, one of my gripes was I didn't have, we didn't have consistent training. And I felt, how do you expect me to be on point if I'm not training enough and shooting enough? I, I have to do that. I, I'm not going to perform well. I want to know what the stress is like. I want to know what it's like to fight someone, not just in training, then here and there consistently. So I agree with you. I actually, I'd taken, um, uh, martial martial arts classes on my own. Yep. Um, at while I was in law enforcement, because I was like, I don't have, I'm not practicing enough. And I remember we had one. I didn't know what jujitsu was at the time. And there was one of the guys um, in our office who was doing it, and it was it was new. It was still not as popular as it is now. And he would do uh, classes for us on his own. He's like, Hey guys, whoever wants to come down and wrestle and I'd show up. And I didn't know what, I didn't know what I was doing, but I would show up because I was like, the more I can do this, the better. And even with shooting. Now here's the issue. NYPD is not going to tell their guys, go do this because if they go do it, you're going to learn, learn certain moves in jujitsu or wherever. And they don't want you to do those moves when you're an officer, because it's not a, we well, don't have to. 
You don't can, have to. It's amazing you the don't decisions that you can make when you have more confidence and capability and Correct. you get into those environments and you're not emotionally involved because you understand there's many different physical pathways to get to the end state that you're looking well, for. Well, look, there's something else. Like, I've, I've done jujitsu. There's When somebody's on you and you're, you're down on the ground and you know this is, we're practicing, this isn't real, and your fight or flight It can feel pretty in, goddamn real. It feels, <laughs> you're sitting there. I remember I did jujitsu with my husband. My husband's a huge guy. He's heavy and he would like, I would always pick the big guys for partner because sometimes they size you up and I get mad at the instructors. I was like, I don't want to fight someone yeah. similar to my size. Give me a big guy. And so- you have this panic set in, but that that's that's wonderful because because I'm practicing and getting used to that. Then when it happens to me in real life, I'm not going to lose my shit. I'm going to be like, I've been here before. I understand. I know what moves to do. I understand my body. You learn how to do that. So I, on a personal level, 100% agree with you. And then when I would see people that were out of shape or couldn't do a pull up, I, I would think to myself, how are you here? Why are you here? You have to physically be able to do the job, not only for the public, but also for myself. I'm, I have to go out with you or do an assignment with you, and, and you can't you can't even do a pull-up. And so that's a concern. Now, per, on a personal level, which this will never happen, what departments should do, like if you look at like a beast like the NYPD, they should not defund, they should give them the funds to create proper training classes where they are consistent when your officers know how to handle people better, not to be reactive, not to, you know, they're people. Everyone's like, well, they're officers. They know. No, they're people. Don't think just because somebody's had six or eight months of training, all of a sudden, like, they're, they're masters of how to handle things. They are not. It's a, it's a window within their life. It's consistency. And so if you have them practice consistently, if you create classes, even in the service, I used to kind of... I used to grapple. I'm like, why don't we have like once a week grappling classes or fighting classes? Or why don't we do that stuff? I mean, you know, there's no money. There's no time. We're traveling. I was always stupefied by that. And this is something that I've, I 100% believe in. This is why mistakes are made. This is also how you're going to see how people handle themselves because it's in practice where you see how people handle themselves. And those individuals who do not handle themselves well, those people should not be put in certain positions. It's absolutely true. It's one of, I think, one of the the huge negatives. They don't put the funding to train people to make them. You are giving somebody a badge and a gun. And I understand why people feel the way they feel and why they push back. I know earlier we were talking about, well, doctors or this profession, that profession. But this is a profession where you have the power to end a person's life in a moment or to completely take away their freedom. And so... I understand when people want accountability. They are right. This is a profession where you can't have mistakes. Where our people who are in the street should be, this is a profession who had, should have the most training. And what do you have? You have six months, eight months. Okay, go out in the street. You're done. And then you don't go back out there again. And then you have officers who can't run from one corner to another or can't shoot right because they're shooting once a year. There is some degree where some of it, it's not their fault. And you're right. You have to go do it on your own. Who does it? Some people do it. I did it. You do it. Yep. Not everybody does that. And you do also have that old school way of thinking of what? Let them step to me. And then what? You're going to shoot the person because they step to you? Well, if you look at some of the videos of the use of force, that's what happens because they escalate through their available tool set and they rapidly get to the pistol and their holster. I mean, I get how it happens when in, in arenas where it shouldn't. If you have no other available tools because you didn't invest the time to develop them. Because when we train, and I can't speak for your training, when we train, the one thing I practice the most, bar none, put it, getting my weapon out, getting out of my holster, this move, this move, this muscle memory. My other tools, we practice with them, not as much. Yeah. I practice them, but my go-to move, muscle memory, would be to go for my weapon. It really would. Yeah. That Because that's how I was trained. I was trained, oh, threat, oh, go for your holster. And so this is where the public's like, why don't you go for this? Why don't you go for something else? Shoot him in the leg, Abby. Oh, I can't even. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. I hear that every semester. Shoot him in the leg. I don't even know how to answer that. I, there's moments where I'm like, how do you? I don't even know if it actually. Shoot him in the arm. I don't know if it deserves an answer because it just speaks to somebody. It's a person who's never, never held touched a, gun, a yeah. weapon before. 
who's never, you're not shooting a piece of paper that is static. You're shooting somebody who's moving. You're also shooting somebody who's probably coming at you, who's. Also, there's a lot, a lot of veins and arteries in your legs too. So maybe still not the safest place to shoot somebody. And if you miss, and if you miss, people miss center mass. When you've got that fight or flight and all that's kicking in in your adrenaline, you see officers shoot six rounds and one lands on the person. And so you now you're going to shoot for the... I, that's the one thing. <laughs> and that one bothers me. I'm getting hot. I'm actually sweating when I hear that. That one's just the one where I'm like, I think people who make these decisions should have some experience or should have some exposure to the law enforcement community, even policymakers. If you're going to make these laws, please go out and actually embed with law enforcement and see what they do on a day-to-day activity, a day-to-day basis, and then make laws. Yeah. Make it so that these things don't happen. I absolutely agree. When I see some of these ha- things happen, I look at that and I'm just kind of like, I don't know how, I, you, shame on you because you should not be in the profession, this profession. This profession really is, it's about protecting people. It's not about abusing them. It's not about being a bully. It, it is not that. So I agree with creating laws and, and, and managing it, but these policymakers should be going and embracing the law enforcement community and understanding what they need and then setting these laws and creating them so that it works. It's going to work against people. Crime is on the increase in New York City. I take the New York City subway all the time. Now, everyone's getting their... Somebody's coming up with hammers or hacking people. Oh, yeah, really? They're throwing them off... Yep. Go on Twitter and uh, go under NYPD News, NYPD Scanner. You'll see all the stuff that's happening. It's very, very dangerous now because what's happened is people becoming much more emboldened because they're not, they're being arrested and then released right away. You're curbing the ability for law enforcement to do their job. And so now it's also their, what are you going to do to me? And officers are kind of like, I don't know. What am I going to do to you? I don't want to put my hands on you. What can I do to you? So it's crime is increasing in New York. Crime in the, here. I'm, I'm going to go professor now. It, crime was very high. We had high crime in the 80s and then 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then in the 90s, we saw a huge decrease in crime. Was it mostly organized in the 70s, 80s, and 90s? Organized crime. You yeah. did no, because we still have organized crime now. Okay. You still have. You're thinking the Italian organized crime, but you've got Albanian, you've got Russian, you've got you've got all sorts of crime. And I haven't watched those movies though. No, but I worked. Um, I worked after they got rid of the uh, Italian, you know, the, that type Those of mafia crime. Yes, when <laughs> I was, we organized crime, Russian, uh, Russian uh, mobs, uh, Albanian. Some of these groups are very, very, very ruthless. I remember I worked one case where I was an undercover. I was asked to be an undercover in this case, and this guy, this group, his network, they were selling documents original documents, like an authentic passport, authentic um, birth certificates to terrorists, people who were trying to get into the U.S. So he was doing that. And then at the same time, he was also selling it to certain other people. Um, So I was introduced, they were like, the plan was I would go in and I would pretend to be a sex trafficking victim. What some of these, uh, what they do is they'll bring, I'm just going to pick Russia because I pretended to be uh, Russian. Uh, they will, they'll bring women from Russia and they'll say, come to America. We will, you know, we'll, you'll come to America. We'll give you a job. It'll be great. Then they bring them over and they say, well, here, here's the thing. You're going to come over. You're going to dance. and You're going to do prostitution. You're going to do all these things. We're going to take your documents, your passport, your ID and all that. And then when you've earned your, you, when you've earned whatever cost, whatever dollar amount, a certain dollar amount, you earn your freedom. You'll get these back. So Sure you will. Right, you don't. <laughs> yeah. And so, but that's how they get these these girls. So now I can't get a cell phone. I can't get anything. I can't even rent an apartment. And they are they are controlled by them. So I pretended to be uh, a woman of the night. And I got one of my, uh, I, my accents and I started making deals with this individual. He was tied to the Albanian mafia. And I remember before I started going in, they told me, be very careful. He, these guys are very... Uh, lethal they're ruthless like if they f- figure out who you are you're, you're done like and so I remember even just for doing our deals we went like something like 15 guys came and I never saw that in an undercover thing like kind of being spread out just to make sure I was covered because they were so lethal and I would I started buying documents first it was for me then it was for some of the other girls I introduced other other girls and what we were trying to do is to get him on those because we couldn't get him on 
the terrorist ones. We couldn't, we, we didn't have proof for that. Yeah. So we were doing this. And then eventually we got enough and um, we were able to arrest them. I'm going to take a hard pass on undercover work with Russians and Albanians. <laughs> for people who don't know, they're fucking crazy. Um, <laughs> it's lethal. They're yeah. dangerous. So I, I guess just going back to your, when you're talking about organized crime, that, that, well, you were talking about, it, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So you're saying the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was on the upswing. And I interrupted you talking about Crime was Goodfellas. high. <laughs> In the 90s, 91, 92, crime started to go down. So overall, the past 30 years, what's happened is we've been very lucky. We've seen a huge decrease in crime. And so I think the majority of the population, the younger population, doesn't know what it was like before. Before it was very, it was, crime was very bad. And so we've had this decrease. So we've been very fortunate to be in an environment with low crime. A lot of people attribute it to a lot of different things as to why. There's a lot of different theories as to why crime was uh, decreasing. Now we're slowly, at least I can only speak in certain parts, like in New York City, we're seeing an uptick now in crime. Now, where that's, it's not nowhere near where it was in the 90s, mm-hmm. but some people are concerned that, hey, are we back going back up to where we were before. And some of the minor things we used to see, vandalism and the broken windows theory, which some people don't like, and I'm not saying I'm pro it or against it. All I'm saying is some of the things that were put in place, the mechanisms that were put in place to decrease crime, now people are taking those away. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens when you take these mechanisms away. Is crime going to go up? We're seeing it in the short term going up. And what does that look like now long term? Yeah. How was New York City during COVID and the lockdowns? Because let's just say, I mean, we, I think you and I did a couple Instagram lives while you were, it wasn't even in the thick of the lockdown, but it's safe to say that the experience I had here was probably different than the experience that you guys had there. I think I'm going to move here. This is the best you place to have COVID. There. there is plenty of uh, room in real estate. Just tell people you're from Wyoming. There won't be any issues. <laughs> oh, could you imagine? I'm from New York City. They're like, oh, no, there, there's no land. It's no, all sold out. People are actually really cool, but sometimes they do get pissed from out-of-town money coming in. But My taxi driver, the guy who brought me here, my Uber driver, he gave me an earful. He's like, everyone here is from California, and we've got New Yorkers coming in. I look at my husband. I'm like, don't say anything. Yeah, I'm from California. You guys are from New York. It's fine. <laughs> Just living up to the stereotype, I guess. It seemed like from some of the pictures, it turned into a, a ghost town. And I can't even imagine that for the city of that size. I've never seen it. Those first few months, I think New York got hit first with COVID. We were the ones who got it first. And it I think hit it was us. the coasts. I think uh, it was definitely New York because yeah. it hit us first the most and then it started to spread out. So New York City completely shut down. I never, never saw anything like it. Now it's a lot more open, but there are mask mandates. You have to. What in, do you mean by shut down, though? Are you guys talking? No, I, it was shut down. I don't down. know if you guys live in a house or an apartment, but you're talking like I inside, live in a house. inside the walls of that no, house did no, not no. leave for a long time? They didn't do that. Okay. They did not do that. You could leave, go wherever. No, but did you? I did. Actually, what I did when COVID hit, I did the opposite. I reached out to NYPD and I reached out to Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and... um I hit up Dunkin' Donuts, actually. I said, listen, I want to do something for the first responders because these guys are out working. And then I reached out to Health Aid. They make kombucha. And can we do something where we take, um, where we donate stuff to the first responders? So if I started with some of the hospitals. And literally, Dunkin' Donuts and would give me, like, I had a huge vehicle of stuff. And then Chevy, actually. Chevy, I reached out to Chevy because my car couldn't fit everything. And <laughs> after a, a week, I'm like, hey, Chevy, can you guys give me a car? I need, like, the biggest thing you have. And so Chevy gave me a car, and I went uh, with my husband, and we went to the hospitals. We dropped off donuts and coffee and kombucha to the hospitals, and then we started doing the precincts. And I partnered with the NYPD PBA, um, because NYPD is where I started. And I said, look, I just want to do this. It's I know it's not much, but just to show thank you to the guys, just for morale. And we would go, we would hit about six precincts or locations a day. It was, it was a full process. We'd go early in the morning so we could get morning muster, and we'd go to all the precincts. And by the end, we had done 139 precincts or 69 precincts. I can't remember. We did a, it was, This was about a month and a half, six, to, six locations a day. And we would go with the, with the PBA, and we would deliver coffee and donuts and kombucha in the morning shift. And just, look, I know it's nothing, but it's just to say thank you. And we would go in there. We just want to say thank you to you for what you're doing because yeah. everyone's home. I don't want to say hiding, but everyone's safe at home and you guys are out. And they didn't even have masks 
At, at that time, because it first happened, it was when it first happened, they didn't even have enough masks. I remember we were trying to make phone calls to get masks for them. The officers didn't even have enough masks and the proper gear to go out. And so we did all, I did that during COVID. So no, I did not, I did not stay home. I went out and I gave donuts and coffee. From the pictures I saw though, it seemed like most people were staying home. A lot it, of people. It had to have been, I've only been to, let me see, I've been to New York four or five times. I actually don't, I don't like going. I don't like being around that many people. I'm not from a place like that. I feel uncomfortable. Like I, I feel uncomfortable being in between buildings that are that compressed yeah. together. It's just so different than what I'm used to. And more people, I mean, you'll see more people on a street there than you will in Flathead Valley where we are right now. But some of the pictures and just seeing how it completely flipped on its head and became a ghost town. It was boarded up. You would yeah, go. I can't even Fifth, imagine that. Fifth Avenue was all boards. I'd never seen that in my life. Everything was boarded up. Everything was shut down. It really was. Are there a lot of people moving out of the city? Yes. Where are they going? Montana. That's fine. <sighs> Eastern Montana is lot of the people. most beautiful portion, right on the South Dakota border. In fact, um, there are some articles out that were, came out about housing in New York City, and that there's a lot more apartments. Available, available now. now because people left. They either went out east to Long Island, the Hamptons, or f- further out, or they've left completely because, well, now you don't even have to live in New York City. A lot of places are letting you continue to work remotely. So I can live in New York City and pay $6,000 for a 1,000 square feet, or I can move to Montana or somewhere else and do the same job and live live well. Yeah. A lot of people left New York City. Are you, are you guys actually considering leaving? I want to go. I grew up there and I love it and I live there. I think the only other place I really lived, I mean, I lived in D.C., obviously, for quite a few years. And I lived overseas a lot. When I was in college, I studied in Italy. I did semesters abroad. And I spent a lot of time in Greece. But I think traveling the world and the country, I'd like to do something different. I like the West Coast. I like California. Yeah. I don't know if it's, well, it is different than New York City. But just don't drop yourself in, like, downtown L.A. That's basically the exact same thing. But nicer weather and palm trees. And more douchebags. <laughs> yeah, with, like, fake hair and teeth. Can I ask you, what made you pick here? I did not pick here. My ex-wife was born and raised about three hours from where we're sitting right now. And it is interesting to me. The, the It's like a magnetizing force I've seen from a lot of people who were from Montana and grew up there. Uh, I'd say if they get past like 10 years old, there's this magnetizing pull to want to come back. So it started off, hey, we should go back and visit. And we came back and visited and stayed in VRBOs, I think, for two years. And then finally decided, like, this is awesome. Let's invest in something maybe we'll move back into or move into later on. So we bought our own VRBO, which is the house I live in now. What's a VRBO? Vacation rental by owner. Okay. Have you ever heard of Airbnb? Yes. It is the same exact thing. Okay. It's the competing company to VRBO. Uh, so you can go to VRBO.com or Airbnb.com, neither of which are a sponsor of this podcast. I was so, about to yeah. say, Andy. I would tell you, trust me, if there's a chance to insert a sponsor of the podcast, I would. You will those, do it. <laughs> those two are not. But hey, they know how to get a hold of me. It's no big deal. Um, so we came up here and visited. And then uh, we did an extended month. Basically, uh, my kids' winter break in 20... 20- 16 we did at the house that I live in now and it was just it was a banner year for snow it was like puking snow every night I'd sweep there's a picnic table at my house and I'd sweep it off that was my daily snow measurement I remember and, the photos yeah and wake up and it's like that thick and every day it was like that so the kids were outside and we skied and snowboarded and had fires and um, my sister came up with her husband and kids and my dad was there with his wife and it was just awesome and we went back to San Diego where we were living in a a gated community that was like a horseshoe and I think I could open the bathroom window and touch my neighbor's house the stucco on the outside of their house that was one of six models in the neighborhood so there was like 50 of the houses that we lived in sprinkled all throughout in between the other cookie cutter models and just we're sitting at the dinner table one morning like what what are we doing like why are we doing this like i'll figure out a way to make money in montana and we put our house in the market i think two months later and got the fuck out of there i remember yeah it was good um and i'm incredibly uh fortunate that we came up here I, i don't think i actually could go back not that we lived in a 
place anything remotely like New York City, but I don't even think I could go back to living in a subdivision, to be honest. It, it's just a palpably different pace of life. The quality of life is higher. The cost of living is lower in some ways. The real estate is actually catching up pretty surprisingly fast. Up here? Yeah. Well, the exodus, right? So there's more demand for people, for new homes and for people to sell their homes. So the prices are definitely bell curving up. But yeah, that's how we got here. I might have to rent out the studio across from you. Yeah. Well, hopefully the new studio that I'll be in will be done in like a year. You guys can rent out this one. I will. Ab- well, I will absolutely come to support for that. I'm, I think that's amazing. We'll see. It's still in the conceptual phase. Like I could show you guys the renderings, but I'll be much happier when there's a shovel in the ground. I know, <laughs> but I know you. I know you, and I know that you you execute things. There's dreamers and there's doers, and you're both. Right? But you do things. I try to. I try to. Sometimes I'm unsuccessful. But that's part of. I think that's part of it. Oh, God. I can't even think about how many things I've tried to do and just fallen on my face. I think that's the part of life. I think you. I think that's shouldn't be avoided and I think a lot of people do avoid that but in my own life that's where the growth has come from yeah so. I just yeah I mean look at our TV show that we did together I won't say the name I know you get upset but it was part of the process I have Night if I ever have have had post-traumatic stress it's from that goddamn TV show <laughs> I hated everything about that experience I'll never do it again it's different it was weird yes I get hit up occasionally They're like hey we think you'd be a great host for the show and I just drag it over into the spam bin just like no uh, I'm not doing any of this there was one like Wait a minute. you'll be the host and we'll go around and you'll do missions with special operations mission forces but don't worry like you'll always be successful I'm just Get out of here with that. I'm not <laughs> doing any of that. When do you think you guys will decide whether or not you're going to actually move? I think maybe at the end of this year going into next, I just want to see how some work stuff goes. I also I have my, I take care of my mom. Yeah. So wherever I go, mom goes. So I just want to make sure it'll be a little hard kind of, She all she's known is New York. New, is she open to moving? I don't know if she'll come out this way. She's New York and Greece. And then my brother's out what in the East Coast. So I don't know if... I think that might just be the struggle, unless she goes to Greece to retire, because my dad's since passed. So we, I keep telling her she works so hard, and I was like, "Mom, just you know, just chill out, get a boyfriend, you know, live your life." I I want her to to live, but I do feel, and I'm I'm happy for it. I'm I do feel responsible for her because right now, if it were not for myself and my husband, she would not be able to maintain her home and maintain she just can't New York's way too expensive so yeah. I just I think it was just if it was just myself my small family it would be different so I think when you have that I just want to make sure she's okay she's always been solid by me and I've definitely not was not a good kid I don't know if there is such a thing as a good kid you can be a good kid I think your life falls apart later on you have to have that phase of your life Maybe. I often think maybe because I was so wild and so I didn't <laughs> listen to anybody. I was very stubborn that it kind of kept me. I never did anything. You cannot make me do something I didn't want to do. And that was overall friends, anybody. You can make me do anything I didn't want to do. And if I remember when I went to study, for example, overseas, it wasn't a thing at the time. And it was I grew up in a very small cultural community because my parents were immigrants and it was very much frowned upon that my dad's daughter was going to leave and go to another country to study. And I was looked at, you know, almost like, who does that? That's disgusting, you know, almost like in a very inappropriate, salacious way. Like I'm some, you know, and I did it anyway. I was like, I don't care who says what. I don't care what people think. I'm going to do me. And so I think that part, that stubbornness, that part of me just being like, fuck everybody, help me. Yeah. How did everything go with your book? I was just thinking a second ago, I saw the books on the table because I just had that author in not too long ago. When we sat down the last time, it hadn't come out yet. I no, think. it was right before it came out. It was out. right before because I think I remember talking about- It was a few months before. The pre-orders though. I think you were taking pre-orders. It did really well. It. Did... Are you writing another one? Say yes. No. I, oh. oh, Andy, I can't. You Have you written a book? Of course not. Okay. Do you, it's hard. That's why work. I'm not doing it. I almost got divorced over that twice. <laughs> there are many times I almost got divorced over writing that book. My husband was like, oh my, it was hard. It's, it's a great book. Thank you. So my girlfriend is uh, one of the head coaches for jiu-jitsu a block away from us. She has given away countless copies of that book to uh, women at the gym and people that she knows. And I'm I tried, she humbled. has, 
one original copy. I'm like, give me that copy. I'll have her sign it for you. And she's yes. just like, no. So she refused. Oh, I will send you one. You know, I did not know how the book would do. And typically, one of the concerns was, because I was a woman, and I didn't even think about this, but this is a, apparently everybody else in the publishing publishing world thought about it. Because I was a woman writing this book, would it, would it be received well? Because typically, you don't see this type of book written by a female. And I was just like, I don't care. I'm writing it. It's based on what I've learned. I'm sharing with people. If it's a good book, it'll sell. And if it's not, it's not going to do well. And it, I, and it launched in COVID, actually. Our podcast was, I think, December. It was right before things got a little right off the COVID. rails. <laughs> and then COVID happens in March. And April, my book's supposed to launch. And th- at this point, New York City is dead. Everything's shut down. COVID's happening. So I get a call and, and they say to me, the publishers, my agent, everyone, don't launch it. And I said, why? Well, you know, you're supposed to, I was supposed to do Rachel Ray, all these big shows too. They're like, you know, you're not going to do any of it. They're like, just wait a couple of weeks until this, this whole thing passes and then launch the book. And I really, nobody thought I should launch it because there was like, you, you want to get on the New York Times bestseller list. And I was hearing all this stuff, all this stuff was coming at me. And I remember I, not that I was stressed out. I was just really getting confused because you're having all these people talk to you. Yeah. And I stopped and I said, and I, I really like, I almost like had this conversation with myself and I kind of broke it down. I'm like, why did I write this book? I wrote this book to help people. So if that is true, then none of the other stuff matters. And I can't think of a better time to launch a book than during this middle of this crisis. And so against everybody's advice, every single person's advice, I launched it. And it did very well. It's still doing well. It's published now in, and I didn't expect it, um, Russian, Chinese, um, Romanian, Hungarian, Greek. And it it actually, at one point, it hit, I almost started laughing, it hit number six in the UK, the audiobook, which I narrated, hit number six in the UK, and then Barack Obama's was number four. I was just like, yes! <laughs> right? Two, two that's down, not bad company when it comes bad. to two, audiobooks. Two down from my protectee. Well, it was interesting. I almost emailed his chief of staff because I put some stories about from moments when I protected him and when I protected the Clintons, and I did this chapter on virtues, like the things that I learned from each person, because you can't not be in that environment and not really learn something. I was very fortunate. It was like my own school. It was like a school of greatness. I was very lucky. But because there were stories about them and I wanted to be respectful, I actually sent the stories to each um, to each individual, to, to the Clintons and I, to the um, Obamas, and I said to their staff, and I said, please give this to them, make sure they read this and make sure that they are okay with what I'm writing. And so I just wanted for myself because I was like, I'm not going to write a book because the big thing is everyone's like, oh, Secret Service, it'll be a tell-all. And I was like, I am not doing that book. I am not doing that book. Um, but yeah, it, it, I'm thankful. It's still going strong. It's because it's a good book. Oh, I don't I don't think there's going to be a number two. When you write your first one, then I'll consider writing a second one. I was talking with Jocko about this at the Immersion He camp. wrote a whole bunch. He has got me covered. He's like, don't worry, bro. I've written like nine. So everybody thinks that if you're a SEAL, you get issued a publisher after Buds, which isn't true. You actually get the publisher in second phase. You get the hair product endorsement after Buds. <laughs> But he, I'm like, dude, I'm not writing a book. He's like, don't worry. He's like, I'm not going to stop. He's, he just wrote a novel. So he's now into the nonfiction or the fiction space. He's like, I got you. So he's just going to associate one of those books with me. Not that I'm going to have anything to do with it, but that counts as my book. You should do. I think that's great because having someone to guide you like Jocko, oh, no, no, I think that's great. I'm not great. writing a book at all. He's just going to say, hey, you're a SEAL. Therefore, you have to write a book. But you can just say that this one was written for you. <laughs> you're the ghost writer? Yeah. No, not even at all. It's just like this counts for me. Like, that's good. I think you should really explore it with him. I've read his books. They're great books. They are great books. They're great books. Which, I, why would I write a book that would compete against that? But book? you're not, you're, no, you're, he's got his own authentic um, mindset and the stuff that he does. And you, you're definitely have your own authentic mindset as well. People you have need your to own follow, stuff. People need to follow his authentic mindset. I don't recommend that anybody follow in the you're path not, that I've chosen for you're, myself. But you're, you know, I don't know. Think about, you're sharing your experience. I think what's, Important is not to tell people, hey, look at me, look how special I am, look, I got it right, because I certainly didn't. It's like I just shared my successes and I shared a lot of my failures and I just shared what I learned. And I think that that's what people like. And even when you read books like Jocko's books, like I read Extreme Ownership. Actually, I listened to it. I listened to audiobooks. You you take something away from that. I, I look at it like you're going to a buffet, 
right? When you go to a buffet, you don't eat everything. But you you say, oh, I like this part. I'm going to use this. Oh, that's really interesting. I'm going to use that. And I do think, and I'm helping out your followers here, because I do think people look to you and they like to listen and learn from your experiences and what you've been through and how you explain things. So I don't think you're competing. I think it's just, you're just something different. You're, it's a different thing. Anyways, aren't you guys running for office? He's going to be president. You're going to be vice president? There, no. I'll I'm, be chief of staff. You can be vice president and I just won't be involved. That <laughs> I can't think of anything I would want to do less than that. I know. I don't think he could either. We were, we were actually talking about that on the quick uh, Q&A podcast I did with him a couple Fridays ago. And, you know, his theory is he'll wait until he it's like the absolute last the minute when world. it's on the precipice, which I think might be a touch too late. But I don't know. There's already people flying flags around the valley that are like Trump 2024, which I could care less who people are for or against. I just really would like some more time off before we go through the next election cycle. It's just, just I don't, I'm not ready for it. I'm not emotionally prepared to deal with that again. Politics are, I just because I was always around politicians and you're in the service, you don't just protect the president, you protect all the former presidents. You are protecting Secretary of Treasury, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Yeah, how far down the list does that go? When there was a few, where is a lot? Where is it? Where is it in the structure of government where they're like, you know what? I don't. You're probably okay by yourself. No, because Congress members of Congress have other. They have access to other types of protection. There's Capitol Police that protect. Yeah, but they There's, only protect them when they're at the Capitol building, right? I mean, yes. Secret Service from protection, from my understanding, is twenty four seven. It is 24-7. No, there's nothing like, and I'm not saying it because I came from that agency. Yeah. There is nothing like U.S. Secret Service training. But you have the State Department. They have DSS. They protect people as well. But as far as the service goes, it's pre current president, current sitting president, all former living presidents. It is vice president, current vice president and um, spouse, children of while they're in office. Mm -hmm. Because I had Barbara Pierce Bush, which was George Bush's daughter. I was actually in charge of her team. Mm -hmm. And as soon as her dad actually transitioned out, you know, when Obama came in and she he moved uh, out, uh, we she lost her protection detail after six months of his transition. So you have all that, but then you have Secretary of the Treasury. You have Secretary of the Treasury because the U.S. Secret Service was found was under the secretary was under the Treasury Department. So that and then Secretary of Homeland Security, because now it falls under Secretary of Homeland Security. But I think we have the House. I'm going to say this wrong. I just can't remember. I did all the logistics. The House trade, there's some position that there's hmm. another person that has protection. And then you have all the foreign digs. So anytime a foreign dignitary, a head of state, excuse me, a head of state visits U.S. soil with their spouse, they get protection, regardless of the country, whether we like the country or hate the country. From a, when they visit from a professional diplomatic capacity or when they come here on vacation? When they come. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Because the idea is you don't want anybody getting assassinated on U.S. soil. We don't want that. It looks bad, bad business. That sounds like a good policy. But they can, and we've had it, though, where they can sign off. Oh, they can say, I we've, don't want this? We, they, we've had it a couple of times okay. or maybe a couple of times. We're like, here, why don't you just sign this paper right here? <laughs> Fair. Why don't you sign it? Because a lot of them come here quite often because their children go to school here or they'll come here. One head of state d needed to medical treatment and he's like the president of his country and he did not want to get medical treatment in his country. And he came for a month to New York to get medical treatment hmm. for himself. It always struck me, especially with the poor nations, when I would see them come here and I would think your people... It was always very difficult. That's where politics, I don't want to go down this route, but it was always a very big struggle sometimes protecting certain individuals and just seeing the poverty that existed in their country and then seeing in contrast that their their lifestyle. You know, not everyone's a good leader. Not, not all people are good. You would see a lot of corruption. That was probably hard. But again, at the end of the day, my job was, you would see the stuff, but your job was to, I, I was supposed to take a bullet for them too. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that being challenging. What are you up to now, other than teaching? I don't know if you can talk about the trip you were just on or your future plans. What do you got going on? I was in LA working on a project with Impact Theory. They, um, Impact Theory, they created, um, they helped co-found Quest Bars. You ever hear Quest Bars? Yeah, I love those bars. So, well, the founders, it's not Impact Theory. It's Lisa Bilyeu, Tom Bilyeu. They founded Quest Bars. They sold their company, and then they started Impact Theory. 
and they do a lot of stuff like on on YouTube, um, interviewing online. So I'm doing a two project with them, two projects with with them. One's an online course, and one's a video series I'm doing with them. And then you know me, I'm always in the TV stuff, news and all that. I know, I hear you. News and all those different projects. <laughs> so scripted, unscripted, behind the scenes. So it's just, I wish I could say, like, I don't even know what I do. I do a little bit of, a little bit of everything. Out of all the stuff you do, what's your favorite? I like it all. I like everything. There's not one that stands out? I like, I like creating. I do like TV. I like creating things. I like that. Um, I don't like, you know what's hard? It's hard. I think when I first started, it was hard. When I first left the service, I wanted to go actually straight into news, just doing news, like as a news person. Like cable, TV, like anchor I, news? Yeah, yeah, just news. I didn't even want to bring up where I, my background or where I came from. I really wanted to just transition and not even talk about where I came from. But when I began doing news, they were kind of like the producers and they were like, well, you have to say where you came from if you're going to talk about crime and law enforcement. And I just almost wanted it to just leave that in the past. And I, and now the antithesis has happened where kind of like you have embraced a lot of where I came from and brought it kind of to the circle. But I never, there was always a bit of, I don't know if you felt this kind of, you feel exposed when you get out there and you talk and you share and you have these moments, well, who am I to say yeah. this or share this? I, I've made so many mistakes. I'm far from perfect. I still continue to make mistakes. That gets hard sometimes or sometimes when people put on my social feed oh you're role model and I think to myself I don't I'm happy to share and to inform I just I'm I don't want to be a role model it's hard that it's part. a lot of pressure for sure is there anything that you're not doing that you want to do I've been thinking about podcasts I don't know though I think you should do it I just feel like like you're I feel that I don't there's so many people now doing it. Like you're doing it, you're established. Like this core people, Jocko, and everyone's that have established. I just don't know if now you've got every every other other people have jumped in, and I don't know. I don't know if there's a space for it anymore. To be honest, I think it depends on the type of information or the product that you're putting out. You know, I think all information is important to some degree, but it's not all relevant in the moment. And I think your perspective and point of view on stuff. I mean, there might be. I have absolutely no idea how many podcasts there are that are out there, but I listen to very few because I I want to be refined in my allocation of time. And people will be able to navigate to something that you would put out or not. I mean, that's their choice. So there, it might be a very saturated uh, ecosystem by actual volume, but I think the quality really differs between uh, those individuals that are out there. I mean, just the barrier to entry, you could start a, if you have a laptop, you could start a podcast. I mean, that's the barrier to entry and an internet connection. Well, I came in here today. I was just like, Andy, this is, we're definitely, this is amazing. But this is four and a half years in, I think. Is it four and a half years? Something already? like that. Yeah. This will be episode 198. So congratulations. 52 a year. Can I be 200? Can I be your anniversary one? Uh, it wouldn't technically be my anniversary because it would have to be 204. Why? It to be. It's 52 episodes per year. Oh, well, I like 200. Okay. I'm not, <laughs> uh, let me see. I do have a podcast on Thursday so that, ooh, I'm still going to be one short. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't figured out. Uh, Who's going to be your anniversary episode? I don't know yet. I haven't ooh, figured a surprise. it out. Uh, let me think. Hold on. Let me run the math on this. I might be hunting, so it might be Dudley. It might be by well, giant friend John Dudley. Were you nervous when you launched this? No, because I'm incredibly open about the fact that I am a moron and I don't try to pretend to be anything other than that. I just try to tell the truth. Uh, and I try to say that I don't know when I don't know. I make I have very internal hard boundaries on things that I will talk about and things that I won't, especially with my old job. Um, like I've been open about the fact that I went through a divorce. I have given zero specifics and I never will because I think it's unfair to the other party not having a platform, whatever. I, yeah. I feel uncomfortable even saying the word platform, but if I have the opportunity to tell my side, it would be unfair for the other person to not have that opportunity, so that's a hard pass. People know that I have kids, but I have very hard boundaries when I'll talk about anything about the kids, and I don't talk too much about uh, my personal life, and other than that, 
I mean, quite frankly, I'm just more interested in other people and their experiences. So I try to have more conversations about them than myself. But I wasn't nervous about it. But I also did a bunch of public speaking before starting a podcast, which I know you have done public speaking. I do as well. that, and, yes. And essentially, every time you teach, you're public speaking as well. It's true. So I don't think, I think you'd be far less nervous than you probably feel like you would Not be. nervous. Maybe it's not the right word. I think maybe just the exposure when you're so out there. And I never when had you hit the publish button. It's an interesting <laughs> it. I have I have almost no data on the demographics of people who listen to the podcast. I see people sometimes like wearing the T-shirts and hats and it's crazy. I was at the telling you guys at the origin camp and people were I made some jujitsu rash guards because people were asking me to and they were wearing them there. It's like this is fucking weird. Right. Your stuff. <laughs> Which I remember you had like a cleared hot hot um, vehicle. Remember that a while back? A cleared hot vehicle? Oh, a trailer? You had something. Oh, I still have that. It's called, It's the Do Awesome Shit Mobile. Is it? It's a trailer wrapped in an American flag. And it sounds yes. like a bald eagle when it drives down the road, I think. <laughs> I don't know. No, I still have that. Yeah, it's in storage. I don't get to use it as much. But it is... I just try to be myself. That's... I, I think a lot of people try to be something that they're not. And I feel incredibly fortunate about the people that I've been able to meet throughout my life and they've left a large mark on me and I try to give them credit every single time and not take credit for things that I didn't do and like I said be honest about what I what I do know and what I don't I don't think I'm an expert in anything I have some bizarre experiences that people seem interested by and I've made a lot of mistakes and I try to be very honest about those so people can learn from them and also so I can try not to repeat them which I don't have a perfect track record of <laughs> <laughs> I hear that so yeah I mean I have no idea where it's going I never thought in a million years I'd have a podcast, but uh, yeah, here we are. It's amazing. It's been wild. It's been an interesting ride. How do you deal? Do you deal? Um, I'm curious. I'm asking. I'm just curious. Fire away. Like mean stuff. Like not that you give a shit, but like, how do you handle anybody that posts negative or like the, 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 those types of people, trolls or whatever they call them? How do you deal with that? Do I you don't... respond? Do you block? <laughs> what do you do? Do you tell them to go fuck off? What do you do? Combination of all three, generally. I don't spend an insane amount of time on social media. So when I do respond, it's often a matter of timing. Like I'll, I'll see a comment. Some of them get under my skin, but oftentimes I'll see them weeks after the comment was made. And it's like, hey, I'm not even going to bother getting back to that person. Occasionally, uh, I'll, I'll log on to check something or just to mindlessly waste some time and one will catch me. And what I'll generally do is write, something creative back with a uh, very colorful language and then I delete it without actually <laughs> posting it. So I get my thoughts out and then I'll think of a more professional way uh, to or explain my thoughts or I will thank them for their feedback. Uh, oftentimes that's what I like to do is I will just say, hey, thank you so much for your well thought out feedback. It really has helped me change my <laughs> perspective on this issue and in life. Uh, and I can't thank you enough. I really, really appreciate it. And they'll just be like, and then it, they're just like, fuck you. And it gets them to twist <laughs> off. So I'm going to call that a victory. Um, I have talked about this a little bit recently, but I'm really, I'm really embracing the power of subtraction in my life, like getting rid of things that aren't beneficial. That block button is an amazing tool. Instead of even bothering to respond to somebody that you don't know on the internet. Just block. Just block and be, and be done with it. Can I ask you something? I'm curious because you're, because I know you and I'm just curious what type of what type of negative stuff do you get I'm just um, kind of wondering how can I've, they not like you Andy uh, but, well I've covered this at length already today about how much I'm basically a moron and I'll say some dumb shit sometimes and people will ask me questions and I'll give them my honest answer which they don't like sometimes I probably should apply a filter between my brain and my mouth and I don't always uh, I got some hate around COVID um I've gotten some hate around the vaccine. First off, people are like, oh, you know, you're acting like COVID's not real. I fucking had COVID. Um, I I'm, had it too. Yeah, I'm not an anti-vaccine person. My personal thought is, is I'm going to wait it out and get a little bit more information. I'm not in a high risk category. I just spend a lot of time per week trying to physically train because it, it does more for me emotionally. I'm a healthy person, um, but people are very emotional about that yes. topic. So it seems like it... It's generally around those things. or And sometimes I'll have episodes with 
uh, people that I used to serve with, and a couple, then there'll be some people like, hey, you guys are just, uh, what do they call them? A military hawk, some, something like that. War mongers. You guys are just part of the military industrial complex, like that type of stuff. And that's just like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. So, I mean, the view must be great from the fucking sofa you're sitting on exactly. in your mom's garage. Right. You know, so. What are you doing to, to serve or to help? And maybe they difference. are doing something, but uh, don't be an asshole. I, just, I don't know anybody who is a, like a very healthy and happy person that spends any time talking negatively on the internet. Like I've actually never had the desire in every video that I've ever watched or every post that, that like, you know what? You know what I need to do? I need to get on here and tell this person how much they, like it doesn't even cross my mind. Like sometimes I'll go into my buddy Tim Kennedy's page and I'll troll other people. Just say like things like, oh, hey, it, it, this wouldn't have happened to you if you used to be a SEAL. And people will lose their <laughs> shit because like, they don't realize Tim and I actually know each other. And he'll text me and be like, this is amazing. Please don't ever stop. But I mean, and so for that, I guess I'm asking for it a little bit, but I've never, ever had the desire to try to knock somebody down online. So at the end of the day, I just feel bad for people who want to do that because it's just a sign of their happiness. Yes. Which is non-existent. If that's what your thing is to put other people down on the internet, then I don't have time for it. I agree with you. I've never actually, I don't think I've, I'll comment on somebody's page that I know. Yeah. Hey, great photo or great. Or even with you, when you posted, I was like, hey man, I got to come back out there. That's the extent of it. I don't comment on people's stuff. I've never, even if I don't like something, I I feel that there's this loss of just letting people say what they want to say. and. Yeah. You're going to make a mistake. And I think this is where people become so unforgiving. You're going to make a mistake. You're going to say, well, we, we're in this this space, this weird space where if you say the wrong thing, you're immediately attacked or canceled. I want to know who out there has not said the wrong thing or nobody. done the wrong thing. Yeah, nobody. It's a very unforgivable and a very, you're either all the way this way or all the way this way. And it's interesting. I don't, COVID and vaccines, I don't talk about that for yeah. that reason. I remember this summer I went to Greece, my book launched in Greece and because I'm Greek and my parents were there and they did some, set up some media. So I said, I'm going to go and do the media for the book in Greece. And so I hit, you know, the news cycle and the TV shows. And one of them really wanted me to talk about COVID and what's happening here in the U S and all that. And I was, I pushed back. I was like, I'm not getting on to talk about COVID because yeah. it was, it was a big discussion there. The vaccine's a big discussion there. I said, I, I will talk about the book. I will talk about shootings. I will talk about terrorism. I will not talk about this. I was like, first, I'm not a medical doctor and I don't want, I'm not the person to get out to speak about this. And I don't want to share my personal beliefs or whatever with anybody because people are so passionate about this. And that's a polite word. I try to be polite. <laughs> try to be polite. Yeah. And I just kind of, I'm with you. It's just like, if you have the energy to sit and write hateful things, you have to pause and look at yourself and think, yeah. what is going on within me where I have to write this to someone? But it's also keyboard courage. It's kind of like, say, say it to my face. Yeah, but even that step, though, the keyboard courage. I mean, think about it. Take a second to think. Do you, the people in your circle that are the happiest and the healthiest... Do they have any desire for keyboard courage? Do they have any desire to try no, to No, I mean, keyboard, cur well, I think, excuse me, I think cowards get behind a keyboard and text and write stuff. Except when for I sure. get mad at my husband, I'm allowed to do that. When I send him some texts when I'm pissed. That's not the same thing. But you know the person on the other <laughs> end. I'm talking about uh, Instagram yeah. user when you 4x95 hate. dot dot lollipop sign. Like the ones that are the biggest dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter's vicious. That's you just stay off of it. Twitch is, do you, are you on it? I have an account. I don't. You don't post on it. Not really. I feel like Instagram's like the nice place. People usually are pretty okay on Instagram. Instagram is for very serious shit, like pictures. Yeah. <laughs> is this pretty? Do yeah. I need to filter this? How do I do this? For I dudes have riding angle? horses with the American flags and six shooters. I'm like, that's what Instagram is for. It's happening right in front of me. What is today. Andy doing now? That's what I was doing. I was taking a picture of that man. Yeah, it's uh, the negative commentary, the desire to put people down. I just think it says so much more about the person who is typing than it does. But, it, yeah. so, and I try to keep that in mind. There are, of course, things that are said that get under my skin. And occasionally I'll get back and forth with somebody. But you realize, just like in conversation, it's not they're not really listening. You know, there's no opportunity to change anybody's because of belief structure. Belief system. Yeah, or system or whatever it may be. It's just not going to happen. It's they're just it's tr it's like a radio that's stuck on transmit. Do you know that 
oh, and I'm totally going to get this wrong. My husband explained the science behind this because we have come from different backgrounds. But when you tell me, like, let's say I have, I believe something specific. And when you tell me things about what I believe in and you support it, you say something that supports my belief system, my brain activates and I feel good. My hormone hormones get released. I feel good. And so it makes me want to believe more what you've said because it's in line with what I believe. When you say something to me that does not, that is against what I believe, right, is the antithesis, or you say something that's in contradiction, I don't get that same sensation. And so that's why it doesn't impact me. You ever talk to someone and you try to express something and you're thinking, I'm speaking to them in a language they understand. Why are they not hearing what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That there's actually now science behind it that they only hear what they want to hear also because biologically it helps create that cycle. Whereas if you say something that is not to their liking, they don't get that same biological reaction. And hence, that's why they don't hear anything you're saying. There's that makes a, sense. It's, it's, it's really interesting. This is why you have such a, there's either this side or this side and there's nothing in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. The problem is when I see Bean tweets, my initial response is, well, I want to be like, go oh, fuck yourself. And I can't do that. So I don't do it. No, you, you totally can do that. Who's <laughs> telling you you can't? I might lose my teaching job as a professor. <sighs> Life's about the choices you make. <laughs> maybe the teaching job isn't for you. I, there's moments where I think maybe I shouldn't <laughs> be teaching. I don't know. I've, I've thought about, is there like an ethical branch within the school that I can call up and say, hey, am I allowed to, if I write this, will I lose my job? Yes, you will. <laughs> yes, you will. You're probably better off not engaging with people like that. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Closing thoughts. We've been at it for two and a half, two hours, 45 wow. minutes. Wow. You know, our last one was long too. Yeah. Wow. Well, my closing thoughts are, I am happy I came out. This was completely impromptu and it was, I was going to LA and I'm like, man, I'm going to Montana and I, I'm glad I did. I'm happy to see you. And I'm, I, I, I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing. And I respect it. I appreciate that. Yeah. I definitely appreciate you guys taking the time to come up here. I have no idea where this train is headed, but I'm going to enjoy the ride. I don't fucking know either. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know. Perfect. It's just whatever comes up. And the most annoying question ever I ever get asked What's your five-year plan? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. I can only answer that in the reverse. I could tell you what I don't want to be doing. What don't you want to be doing? Office job, nine to five, suit and tie. Couldn't do it. Yeah, I understand that. Working for somebody else. I don't think I could do that anymore either. Having been on my own now for coming up on five, six years, having to figure it out on my own, which allows you to craft a schedule based off of your desires and the things that you really want to pursue based off what empowers you. I don't, I don't know if I could surrender that back to somebody else at this point. Uh, and I don't want to ever live anywhere else other than I do right now. So like I would say those three, I could answer that in my five-year plan. Like if I, if I had to draw an X on like a, a virtual map of where I wanted to land, pff, I don't know. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> awesome. Cool. All right. Till next time. All right. Then. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube. I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and Share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero-star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com. And there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com. Click on the shop tab and hopefully something in there looks like 
it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you can tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. Until next time. See you.